Good morning and welcome to today's here joint hearing of the Council Transportation Committee and Oversight and Investigation Committees. First, let me recognize my colleagues who are here with us, Council Member uh, Torres, Levine, Ayala, Cook, and Lander. This is an oversight hearing on Taxi Limousine Commission's role in the taxi medallion crisis. The first thing that I'm gonna say is that this hearing is only a beginning of many of the hearings that we will be holding. Today we are starting with the yellow taxi medallion, but one of the things that I want to accomplish is to see a level of the reorganization of the taxi limousine to reorganize the four sectors, the yellow medallion, the livery, the corporate account black car, and the other uh, car, uh, 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 black car so that we can define the right and responsibility and have a clear understanding on what is the expectation that we expect for them to follow as they will do business with us. Annie Danis Rodriguez, the chair of the Transportation Committee. Today we will be hearing four bills. The first is intro 1584, sponsored by Council Member Adrian Adams, which will require requiring annual financial disclosure from each person who has an, any interest in any taxi cab license. The second is intro 1605, sponsored by Council Member Francisco Moya, which is related to the approval, approval of, a, of a, a purchase or transfer of a taxi cab license, followed by intro 1610, which is a bill sponsored by the council member, council member Richie Torres, chair of the Committee on Oversight and Investigation, which will create an Office of Financial Stability within the Taxi and Limousine Commission. Today's hearing focuses on the decline in the medallion value and understanding the blind eye taxi and limousine took that may have led to this problem that allow corruption and backroom deals to take advantage of immigrant workers. As I have said before, this crisis didn't happen overnight. This crisis is the accumulation of, of lack of leadership in the past. So one thing that I want to be clear is that also as, as there's new intern taxi limousine commission today, they're doing the best they can. So this conversation today, this question today, it's not at a personal level, but it's about how the institution been functioning and things that has to be done to improve it. The yellow medallion taxi is a, sim is a symbol of New York transportation network and for decades served a vital role in our city's transportation system for those who live, work, and visit here. But fares and ridership are down considerable and many individual medallion owners are facing foreclosure and bankruptcy, upending their personal lives and destroying their savings. These are small business owners, many of them immigrants who invested hundreds of thousands of dollars into a medallion in hope of achieving the peace of the American dreams. We have 6,000 individual medallions owner the city of New York. We need to stand there for them. We will hear a number of bills that seek to increase the regulation of the medallion market. The bill that I have, that I, my bills, intro 1608, will require the Tax and Limousine Commission to evaluate the character and integrity of taxi cab brokers, agents, and taxi cab licenses. This is another step to ensure that Taxi Limousine Commission is properly overseeing the industry and to ensure that bad actors are not able to enter the market. As a city, we, we should have done more to ensure that our taxi medallion drivers were protected. As a Transportation Committee Chair, I will continue to work alongside my colleagues and the Speaker Johnson to ensure that we help our struggling taxi medallion drivers. We must also find a way to hold the people responsible for, their, for this financial crisis accountable. This crisis 
was not accident, and we must make sure that taxi medallion owners receive justice. Now we will hear from the co-chair of this committee, Council Member Richie Torres, chair of the Committee on Oversight and Investigation. Good morning, everyone. I'm City Council Member Richie Torres, and I'm the chair of the Committee on Oversight and Investigations. It's an honor to co-chair today's hearing with Council Member Rodriguez. The collapse of the medallion market, properly understood, should be remembered as one of the greatest government scandals in the history of New York City. The bankruptcies and foreclosures, the suffering and the suicides were not the consequences of market forces beyond the city's control. The humanitarian crisis is the product of a deregulated, overpriced, overleveraged medallion market that the city not only failed to regulate, but also helped create through aggressive auctions, advertising, and approvals of predatory transactions. Indeed, the central culprit of the medallion crisis is the Taxi and Limousine Commission, which succeeded as a speculator but failed as a regulator. And for those seeking greater clarity about the origins of TLC's decline as a regulator, listen carefully to these words. Quote, what we've created here is the currency in the medallions themselves. We've diverted the attention of the industry from serving the public to being concerned about the value of that commodity. These words were not spoken in 2019. These words were spoken long before there was a medallion bubble, long before there were even medallion auctions, back in 1987 by former TLC Commissioner Gorbin Gilbert, who 30 years ago could see clearly TLC's dangerous slippery slope towards speculation. He saw clearly the corrupting culture shift from a TLC that serves the public to one that cashes in on a commodity, even if cashing in meant abdicating its role as a regulator. In the mid-90s, the city began the practice of auctioning off medallions. And in the 2000s, the city took the auctions to new extremes. Over time, TLC became more interested in being a speculator than in being a regulator. It was more interested in the paper value of the medallion as an asset than it was in the real-world incomes of drivers or the real-world revenues of the taxi industry. It did not matter that brokers were systematically preying upon unsuspecting buyers. It did not matter that lenders, like Andrew Merstein, were widely dispersing loans that financially enslaved driver owners. It did not matter that speculators like Gene Friedman or Michael Cohen were manipulating the market or evading taxes or stealing wages from their workers. The things that should have mattered did not matter to your government. The only thing that mattered to TLC was the holy grail of medallion values and the money it made for the city. The city had no interest in reigning in the market and breaking up the party because there was money to be made. Billions of dollars on the backs of driver owners who have committed suicide or filed for bankruptcy or been condemned by crushing debt to a life of indentured servitude. Drivers who were promised the American dream have been given a nightmare, and the city that sold them that American dream ultimately sold them out. The medallion market collapse is a cautionary tale of what happens when both government and markets are governed not by laws but by greed. Just like there were brokers, lenders, and speculators all too eager to kill the golden goose for short-term profits, the city of New York was all too eager to kill a once golden asset for short-term revenues. When it comes to the medallion market, money was indeed the root of all evil. Our purpose here today is not simply to hold a city council hearing. Our purpose is more profound, to force the city to come to grips with its own role in creating a bubble that impoverished and immiserated many for the sake of enriching a few. A moment of reckoning is long overdue. So too is restitution for the drivers, and so too is regulation of the medallion market, which has been left unchecked. Now, I, I just want to note, three weeks ago, we requested from TLC uh, the Roth report. And three hours ago, uh, our committee received a copy. 
The Roth report was written in 2010, and it confirms that TLC and City Hall knew everything. TLC knew that there was speculation in the market by the likes of Gene Friedman. They knew that there was predatory lending in the medallion market. They knew that the market was at risk of collapse, and it's a damning indictment of TOC's failure as a regulator. Uh, so with that said, I will hand it back to Councilmember Rodriguez. Thank you, Co-Chair Torres. Uh, we will have a first panel composed mainly by drivers and those who advocate for them. Uh, I'm going to call the name, Golan Istiaki, Mohammed Aliu, Vera B. Desire, Christy Peel, Good morning. My name is Beta V. Desai. I'm the executive director of the New York Taxi Workers Alliance. It's hard to imagine the conditions that are facing the drivers in New York City today. And it's even harder to imagine the extent to which this crisis that's taken so many lives and ruined so many futures was all manufactured. And it was all done in concert between public government and private capital. In the middle of it was a workforce of over 95% immigrants that have been left now practically penniless. From the medallion was first created in 1937. At the time, 12,000 were sold for $10 each. No more were sold again for another 60 years in 1997 under the Giuliani administration. Prices were considered stable from 1995 to 2002, and then the spike started, primarily in 2004 to 2014, when it finally crashed. The spike in medallion values coincides with almost the entirety of the term of the Bloomberg administration. But what we want to put on the record today is it did not end in 2014. And their sleight of hands, we believe, has absolutely continued since 2014. Many of the same government officials that oversaw the over, you know, the over inflation, the overvaluing of the medallion were the same forces that went, then went ahead to go and work for Uber and Lyft. And today, some of them even work in the state government at the governor's mansion, no less, the same person who has been the champion of these companies since they entered the market in New York City. We don't think this is a coincidence, and we want questions to be answered. We ask you, as, as the city council, to call those people into these halls, because we want answers from them. We want to see that Roth report be publicly issued, we want to see every single line of it. We also want to see the reports that were written by the State Department of Financial Services in 2000, from between 2010 to 2014 that found a number of illegalities and lending practices, but they never even issued one summons. 
They didn't issue one summons, and they never even increased their oversight. In that same time period, they still went ahead and watched this city sell 1,500 more medallions, knowing that the price had been artificially inflated, knowing that the lenders were not looking to, to have the buyers even make a minimum deposit, let alone the 20% that would otherwise have been required under federal law had they not been um, exempt from those regulations by Congress. All of these regulators, according to the New York Times, seven government agencies knew what was happening. They allowed it to continue. And in that time period, from 2004 to 2014, the city of New York made $850 million. That's just from the auctions and the, the private market transactions alone. There was another over $600 million that the state of New York made from the 50 cents tax. And I ask you to understand that these two things are connected. I was there in 2009 when the state looked to impose the tax. And the belief was that the medallion market was so healthy that it could take that extra tax on. That same administration today, in actually, a year ago in 2018, ignored reports of how the current surcharge of $2.50 would reduce revenue by an additional 30%. They ignored that. They ignored the fact that four drivers had already committed suicide by the time that they imposed that tax. There are nine drivers in total that have committed suicide. Three of them, 33%, are owner drivers, even though owner drivers represent less than 5% of the entire workforce. They have disproportionately represented the drivers in crisis despair across this industry. We want answers as to how these officials were allowed to keep that revolving door going, to go from public office into the very halls of private capital that they were supposed to be regulating. And make no mistake that the storyline does not end in 2014. The impact of Uber and Lyft has not been a 10% drop in revenue. It's been closer to 36% drop in revenue for each individual taxi cab from 2011 up to today. Adjusted for inflation, that's 44% drop in revenue. What we're seeing is that at the end of the year, owner drivers end up in deficit of an average $30,000. Almost every single penny they earn behind the wheel on the meter goes entirely to either operating expenses or back to the state in the form of the taxes or back to the city for the improvement funds. Almost none of it is left over for them to spend on for their cost of living for their families. And so at the end of the year, they're averaging a deficit of $28,000. People are dying in debt. They're maxing out credit cards as cash flows to go week to week, month to month, sometimes day to day because they don't have enough revenue even after working 60 to 70 hours a week. They're going from working six days to now seven days. We have so many members who are now in their late 60s and early 70s. They expected to retire. Some of them had retired and they had to come back to work and drive behind the wheel. One of the hardest jobs in the United States of America, where a worker is 30 times more likely to be killed on the job, 80 times more likely to be robbed on the job. They have, you know, some of the highest levels of stress and physical pain of any occupations in the U.S. And in their 70s, when they finally thought they were going to be able to retire after serving the streets of New York for 40, 30, 25 years of their life, almost the entirety of their adult lives, they're back to driving, and that is 
absolutely criminal. It is criminal. Every single person in the city of New York should feel a deep shame when you look on, in that taxi and you see a man or a woman in their late 60s and 70s back behind the wheel because their retirement was stolen. It was literally taken out of their hands. It was stolen from them without any warning. There was no time for preparation for themselves or any member of their family. I want to ask the David Yaskis and the Ashwini Chabras and the Andrew Cuomos of this world. I want to ask the Gene Friedmans and the Mr. Merstings of this world. Did Dorina Nichescu? whose husband spent his entire adult life driving so with his medallion so he could have a retirement in case, God forbid, he passed away for his wife of over 40 years? Do, do they understand what they cost that family? She has nothing left for herself. She gets less in the medallion rental per month from the broker than what she pays to the bank. And she's one of the luckier ones because she has less than $200,000 left on that loan. We know of members who have $90,000 left on their loans and they're paying mortgages of $3,000 a month. That's unacceptable. And how dare, how dare these, these lenders and these credit unions, Melrose, Lamto, Progressive, Montauk, Bay Ridge, Omega, they all have to answer. How dare they continue to sell the medallion to a predominantly immigrant workforce who they left penniless while behind closed doors they made plans to exit the industry? All of these forces in private capital and in government, they not only look to jump the ship and go into a private yacht, but they left that ship without holes when they pulled out the oars from the sides and they left it sinking. And that's the crisis we are in today. We have also found that on average... Sorry. If you may summarize, please. I will summarize. We have found on average that not only is the deficit at the end of the year close to $28,000 for owner drivers, but also we have found that the average medallion expenses are $5,003. The average medallion payment alone is $2,800. The city council needs to establish a permanent task force that is going to establish the current value of the medallion. Any loan amount that is above that value must be forgiven, first and foremost. Must be forgiven. Two more minutes. One minute. <laughs> Secondly, there needs to be a cap on the mortgage. You should not have to pay more than $900 a month on the mortgage of that medallion. We need a retirement fund for all drivers, and we need an immediate payout to our older drivers, to our seniors who we love and for whose labor and sacrifices we are grateful for having served this city. They need to be able to retire immediately with dignity and the city needs to ensure that. The city council task force needs to be authorized by law to oversee this current crisis, become permanent task force, fully authorized to cap prices, mortgages, and free sales when, ne when necessary. Stop the predatory lending practices, require credit review, ban confession of judgment, ban interest-only payments, require attorney review of agreements, financial clinics are not enough, provide free legal representation for every individual owner driver to go through bankruptcy and other proceedings to negotiate loan modifications and come up with a longer term solution and continue to regulate first time regulate the entire industry as a whole including those that are being bank bankrolled by by Wall Street, the same forces that worked hand in hand with the very administration that oversaw and encouraged this crisis that we're in today. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. And because it, 
important role that you've been playing, uh, standing for the drivers. We extended the time for the race. You're going to be putting the clock in three minutes. Thanks. Good morning. My name is uh, Muhammadu Aliyu. And uh, I just want to go straight up and say, what's going on in the industry is not American. It's not New Yorker. I can even say it's not humane. It is brutal. I, I, I don't know how to describe what's going on here. That being said, I came from West Africa in 1993 to America. This is the land of opportunity. This is the land of dream. And I took advantage of it. When I came in, I was working in a warehouse as a helper. Until 2001, a friend of mine took me to join the yellow industry, which I did. And then there was an auction, auction in 2004. I heard of it. And uh, if another friend of mine said, you can get a medallion, which I did. And this, is what, this was my dream. And it was going nice and fair and beautiful. And this was America, the land of opportunity and dream. And I was living it. Until 2007, I got my house here in the Bronx, in my community. It's not many of us that have that own a house. So everything was fine. And then now come 2010, the, the dreams start getting bad, slowly and slowly. I have four kids. One is mentally ill, and then I got three kids. One is a girl, she's five years old, a two years old, and I have a seven months old. I'm, was, I'm doing everything for them. And now, today, I'm, everything is taken away from me. I do not understand what's going on in this city. This is not New York. We don't do things like this in this country. We American. This is a country for immigrants. I do not believe if it's not for us being 95% of immigrants, whatever going on right now will happen. There is so much injustice, and I don't believe people, uh, people looking the other way. That's unbelievable. So today, I'm calling on you to have mercy on us. We are immigrants. We came here and we are American. We're part of the system. And we want to live in, we believe in it. I, I owe more than $700,000. And today when I check my medallion value, it's less than 100000 I work seven days a week. When I drop, I don't even know where to go find a job. I, I, I owe so much. I'm, Minus $54,000 a year. Minus $54,000. I don't even know how to get out of this debt. I think the only way out is for you to make it straight, to make it American, to make it New Yorker, to make it the way it's supposed to be. Until then, do not be surprised when you got nine people thinking about suicide, and that had suicide. Every single day, every single hour, I think about taking my own life. I think about suicide. The only thing that stopped me is my four kids, because one is mentally ill, and the other one, they're very little. So if I do so, what's going to happen to them? Otherwise, I'm supposed to be a millionaire today, and I'm proud of it being a millionaire today. And you guys are, are, are trying to take that away from me. It's not acceptable. I'm calling on you. Please, please have mercy on us. Help us. Thank you very much. Good morning. My name is Gulam Istiak. I came from this country on 97. On 2006, on the auction, the New York taxi medallion, I buy it, $396,000. After 2014, this thing is very bad to me. When the price is going up, mega, not only the mega, the Westway, Melrose, everybody is calling to us to take out the money from the medallion. I take out the money from the medallion on 2014. So the, they make the loan, it's okay but it should be over after three years, May 1st, 
2017, but when the loan is over, I try to negotiate it with them. They say it's not possible. And after six months later, they seized my medallion without any question. At the same time, I found that they charged me 3.75, but the bank charged me 350. I negotiated try to them. At the same time, I am very sick. Suddenly, they are seized my medallion without any question. I pay on time. This is the medallion, November 5, 2017, but I discharged from the hospital November 3, 2017. And after this, I have lumberectomy. I cannot work for two months. And after this, they put the loan for three years, the Newark Community Bank. But at the same time, I found that the Newark Community Bank is paying to mega funding $658,000, but I don't know it. I don't want to do that. They pushed me to do it, and on the credit report, the history is nothing is over there that they are lending to the money. On 2019 uh, March, I go try to negotiate with them that, look, I cannot do the, my uh, business because this is going, uh, the medallion um, payment is too high. They offered me, you have to buy the another medallion because you have two partners, and both of them is the collateral, and the interest you have to pay only for the three percent for two years. I have a lot of debt. I buy the house on 2015. I have little income from the house for the rent, but I have a expense. I have three child, me and my wife. My father and mother will leave me. Whatever I make the income on 2018, the cash is going to the $11,971, and the credit card is $37,000. On the credit card, it should have to pay 3.75% on top of that. So after the reduction, I cannot afford it. I tell them, do something. They cannot want to do it. The Meridian financing and the other insurance liability, I cannot afford it. The, the uh, mega funding and the other mega funding and the other uh, newer community bank they push us. If you are not doing that, we will take your house and the medallion. Then what I do? I am the immigrant. Then I have to go to the street with my three, three children. Everybody have the same problem. Everybody take out the money, buy the house, and we are stuck. That's the game they did it. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, my name is Christy Peel. I uh, run the Center for New York City Neighborhoods. Uh, thank you, Councilmember Torres and Rodriguez, for uh, inviting me here today. Uh, the Center promotes and protects affordable home ownership. We were founded by a, a group of uh, city government officials and philanthropy, including the City Council back in 2008 to address the foreclosure crisis. It's worth asking what a housing agency is doing here at a, a tax simulating hearing. Uh, we're here to remind us all uh, of the parallels of, between the, the tax simulating debt crisis and the foreclosure crisis, and also uh, to remember what we were able to do collectively at, at the city to respond to that. Uh, so uh, the, the parallels are, are, are many. Not only were there a, a series of uh, brokers peddling unaffordable loans to homeowners uh, during the, in the run-up to the financial crisis. We see that in the medallion crisis as well. Uh, there are, I, I lay out a couple of other in my written, written testimony, um, but since time is short, I'm going to uh, try and be quick. But another important parallel is that the majority of New Yorkers who are har harmed in both circumstances are people of color. Members of these communities have traditionally been excluded from means of building wealth through home ownership and access to small business capital, so it's doubly cruel that uh, these New Yorkers have been denied safe, fair financing to pursue both or either. So quickly, some lessons that we learned uh, and some recommendations. And to address uh, your point, this is how we can do it in New York. Uh, since 2008, the center with funding from the council and the administration, uh, we've not only responded to the uh, foreclosure crisis, but we responded to Hurricane Sandy. And we uh, represent a network of housing counseling and legal services groups. And, and we really, we have the chops uh, to be able to respond to this crisis as well, collectively at the city. But one of the most important things that we need to do immediately is uh, 
you know, put borrower protections in place and make sure the borrowers have access to free legal services, like Barabi mentioned. Uh, it's really important that we get into the, the loan documents and we understand the fact patterns and the issues that were happening to a greater degree so we can begin to uh, make some, real, um, some policy changes at scale. No, uh, most notably, 1605, uh, requires an assessment of a borrower's ability to repay. Obviously, this was a fundamental tenet behind uh, the Dodd-Frank rule and the forming of the Consumer Protection uh, CFPB. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of concern about the way these, these loans have been classified as business loans when they require so much personal debt, and there are no consumer protections here, so that's a, a huge issue. We need to provide relief to existing uh, medallion owners. We can do this in many different ways. Uh, we can provide individual loan restructuring services, just like we did in the foreclosure crisis. Uh, we want to be able to sit down and evaluate uh, the individual financial circumstances and the legal rights and remedies that might already exist. And if they don't exist, you know, it helps us go to Albany uh, and make changes to really, um, you know, get the, uh, uh, some changes in place. For example, we had to entirely rewrite uh, the mortgage servicing rules. Oh my gosh. Okay, <laughs> principal reduction is, is critical. Uh, you can do the loan by loan approach, you can do a pooled approach uh, by buying the loans uh, uh, in, at sale, passing the benefit of, of the uh, purchase price onto the borrower. Um, and direct financial assistance is also a way to help borrowers by giving a 0% loan that can help bring them current if you can't restructure a loan. But the, there are two other really important points I want to make. First of all, we must act quickly. Time is not on our side in this case. It was Time was our greatest enemy in trying to combat the foreclosure crisis. Every day, a borrower gets further, further in debt, and it makes it harder for us to help them. Uh, and secondly, we really must engage an activist regulator, such as the Attorney General. We cannot do any of this without DFS and the AG. Uh, either, you know, either we're changing our laws in Albany and really enforcing them, or really calling on uh, our regulators to enforce the, the protections that may be uh, in place that we haven't discovered yet. So um, also the city, uh, the city council administration laws, it's going to take a tremendous collective will on our part to get the NCUA here and to get the credit unions here, and I really uh, just can't emphasize that enough. It was so difficult for us to get the, the banks to negotiate with our borrowers in good faith in the state uh, mandated settlement conferences, and we don't have that kind of structure here. So we really do need to uh, get the credit unions to the table and, and the debt owners to the table to renegotiate with these borrowers. So thank you. There's, uh, I <laughs> missed a couple of other thank points, you. but thanks for this opportunity. Thank you. And we know that your story represents the story of thousands and thousands, 6,000 individual medallion owners, the thousands of drivers also that they're renting, that they're leasing. So as you know, we've been working for years trying to address this crisis that we know, as I said before, didn't happen overnight. So your presentation here will help us to get the administration to answer some of them. But before we call the administration, some of our colleagues, they have some questions. Council Member Levin. Well, thank you so much, Mr. Chair. That was, that may have been the most powerful opening to any hearing that I've ever heard. Uh, and I, I want to thank Mr. Aliyu and Mr. Istiakik for your bravery and speaking out today and, and uh, your your raw emotion and the powers of your story were very important to get on the record, and they reflect the experience of thousands of other drivers who are suffering because of actions that New York City government took. That is the reason this hearing is being held today, and we owe you accountability, and we are in search of it today, and I'm confident that that will emerge. We also owe you relief. It's not enough to make sure this doesn't happen again because thousands of families are already suffering because of this scandal. The moral debt remains unpaid while you continue to labor under this crushing debt. And we need to look at dramatic solutions from medallion buyback to purchasing mortgages uh, to putting the full legal force of city government behind your negotiations with banks that are refusing to negotiate in good faith with you uh, and a variety of other measures. 
And I'm, I'm wondering whether, uh, perhaps Ms. Desai, um, because I know you've thought about this deeply, whether you can recommend the course of action that you think would bring the most direct relief and that is the most practical at this time. Um, well, really it's everything that you've just outlined, Councilman Levine. I mean, I, th I think that, you know, we've been writing hardship letters to banks, we've been filling out applications. Um, th there's been very slow progress to date, so certainly to begin with, I think that the city government needs to bring all of the lenders in and you know, put pressure on them to modify these loans. And really the main thing for us is it, the real medallion value at the moment has to be established and any outstanding loan balance above it has to be forgiven. The, you know, owner drivers should not be carrying that lifelong debt you know, um, forever. I mean, you're seeing some contracts right now on million dollar loans that are 50 year terms and they're being written to individuals who are in their 40s, right? And so, you know, we, and we need the city to really consider some sort of a joint partnership where perhaps between the city and the bank, the, bird, the financial burden of debt forgiveness needs to be shared. And, and sorry to interrupt only because time is short and I, I totally agree with everything you're saying. Could you clarify again what you think is the actual value of a medallion today and what you think a reasonable monthly payment a debt burden is today based on the actual income and expenses of owner drivers? I mean, I think in terms of the value, I don't want to lend to the speculation, but I will say that from what we see, it would be between like 150 to 200,000, but there needs to be a task force that scientifically and responsibly establishes that value, and without a doubt, the monthly mortgage should not be more than 900 and I just want to remind you that based on our, our analysis, that if given that the outstanding debt, yearly debt that families are in is, is about $28,000 a year, if the mortgages are brought down to $900 a month, that debt will get wiped out and they can be kept whole. And so that amount needs to be capped. Thank you to this panel and thank you to the chairs. Thank you. Councilmember Lander. Thank you to the chairs and thank you to this really exceedingly powerful panel. Um, thank you to Taxi Workers Alliance for the organizing and I also want to thank Brian Rosenthal and the Times for the reporting that has forced our attention to this issue. Um, I really want to drill down a little more on this question of what the city can do right now um, to provide relief to the set of people who are under this crushing debt. I hope we can find a way to force um, debt write-downs, but I know that we can do some things to work out the kind of public-private partnership that the Center for New York City Neighborhoods and the housing community has done in foreclosure relief. So I just want to sketch out one version. Um, let's say for a minute that they're currently worth 200000 and let's say that there's, you know, an average debt outstanding of 700000 on them, just for today's purposes, so we got that kind of $500,000 gap. I hope we find a way to, you know, the task force to establish the value. And I hope we find a way with the attorney general or some others to force lenders to the table. Um, but I'm also willing to have the city put some resources on the table because the city bears substantial share of the, of the blame and harm here. It seems to me pretty straightforward that if the city put $100,000 up, and said, we'll buy those $700,000 mortgages for $300,000. The 200 they're worth plus 100 in subsidy that the city's gonna put out. Obviously, those lenders are in some ways getting over on us by getting $100,000 more than the medallions are worth, but at least they'd have to crush $400,000 on average of that debt. And then we could rewrite mortgages to those owners from this new public-private entity for the $200,000, those that are worth in a well-regulated way with like a soft second mortgage as we've done so often in housing that would evaporate over time or you know be there to make sure that the things are kept in place and drivers would have a sustainable 
affordable mortgage, and we'd have a way out of this crisis that we could do soon, whether or not we can find a legal pathway to crush that debt, and even as we establish a new regime going forward. Does something like that make sense? What do you see as the barriers to it? And shouldn't we, in addition to the good legislation that's on the table today, move forward as quickly as we possibly can to get that established? I'll, I'll just say very quickly, um, um, Councilman Lander, there are banks who will f who foreclosed on medallions, right? And then they've turned around and resold that same medallion for one hundred fifty to two hundred thousand dollars. Why couldn't they have just forgiven the loan on the individual who made the down payment and paid that mortgage for years and years? So you are absolutely right. You know, that all of that can be done, it should be done, and that these banks, they're, they're finding ways to do it when it suits them. We need to force them to do it, you know, for the benefit of all of the individuals that have already invested hundreds of thousands of dollars into these medallions. And, and I so hope we can. I mean, if I get started on how I feel about these lenders, my head's going to explode. But I don't want to run the risk also of us holding out the idea of lender accountability, like that someone's going to go to jail or be forced to do the right thing, which we know they're not going to, and try to do that for 10 years and have that prevent us from taking collective action now to do something to help the drivers. I know that's not what you're saying, but I, I worry a little that if we only focus on accountability, we will fail to come up with a real approach to relief, and I just, I know you feel it and your drivers feel it and we feel it. We must find a way to do both. Yes. So, so if I may, uh, sorry, no. don't want to step on your... Uh, the, the council has already done this, right? So the council was the first money in uh, to the Community Restoration Fund, which helped a, a consortium of not-for-profits with the city's backing buy distressed FHA debt directly from the, the government, as well as to buy some distressed Fannie and Freddie notes. Uh, I'm sorry, just Fannie notes. So, you know, we have the wherewithal, and, you know, uh, it's very possible to determine what sort of a fair price to pay is on the city side and put it on the back end uh, uh, as a soft second in the possibility that the market might come up. But just another point, the market knows what these medallions are valued, right? To, to Badavi's point, you know, if, if uh, distressed debt buyers are buying the medallions out of foreclosure, that's the value, right? Uh, what we struggled with in getting the banks to do principal reduction modifications during the crisis is a modification today means them um, writing the debt down and carrying it on their books. They would much rather sell the banks, I don't know about the, with mortgages, they would much rather get rid of that debt take the loss and be done with it rather than to carry it uh, on a devalued basis. So I think uh, a distressed debt purchasing model, especially on a pooled basis where you could get um, uh, the benefit of it on economies of scale, uh, would really make the most sense here. Um, you know, otherwise, again, you're just kind of fighting on a loan by loan basis, which we're gonna have to do anyway, but to be able to purchase the debt en masse like that, I think would be a really smart idea. Thank you. We, as you know, we've been working with this for years already. And we have that responsibility. You know, we cannot, we are against the clock. Mm -hmm. it, any time, any day that we lose a life or a great work in New Yorkers, it's a shame of us. And as you said, we know that all human beings at some point go through a breaking point. And having your four children there, as you know, as the only motivation and strength that you find when those feeling thought go through your head, continue being strong because, you know, as we know, we don't have choices. When we have children in front of us, we don't have choice more than to stand there for them. Uh, how common is, as you speak to other individual medallion owners, a conversation about uh, the rest of your friends not being able to handle it and, and going through a tough situation? Thank you once again, uh, Councilman. It's devastating. I have a friend, I think, uh, Maybe six or seven months ago, he lost his medallion. I have to talk to him day and night, don't take your life.
He's a very young man, and then he worked very hard. He worked deeply hard, but uh, he never wanted to give up the medallion. But for whatever reason, he, uh, he, has, a, he has to go to hospital. He has a heart attack. They told him he don't to push it too much. But right after he came out of hospital, he went back on the street because he don't want to lose his medallion because of his family. And then I have another one right now. He doesn't even know what to do. Uh, he did everything. He put money into the sun to go to college. The kid is about to finish. He has to go back to NYU. He pushing it, pushing it, but it's not finding no way out. So we hold behind big bill, big debt. We don't even know what to do. And my story is just like many of my friends, just the same way. We really struggling. We are not being able to pay our bill. And then uh, it's very stressful. And then uh, whatever I'm telling you about suicide, I know it's not really you. It's our life. But believe me, every single day, every time I go on the street from Upper West Side all the way to downtown, when I don't find a job, I think about taking my life. I really do. The only thing that stopped me until now is my kid, because I cannot believe what's going on in the industry. It's not possible. What's going on in the industry, no way. It's not possible. This is not American. This is not how America treats its people. America don't treat its people this way. The only thing that come up of my mind is we 95% immigrant. That's the only reason, that's the only excuse for this to happen. Otherwise, this won't happen. Therefore, I want you to go the way America treats its people, especially New York. This is New York City. This is immigrant city. This is our city. This is our place. And we're here forever. Therefore, please, once again, look after us. Please have mercy on us. We belong here. Even we immigrants, we American. We belong here. Please look after us. The struggle is big. The debt is huge. We can't, there is no way. I'm minus 54,000 a year. How am I going to get out of it? This is every year. You guys tell me. How am I going to get out of this thing? I don't know. I have to pay my mortgage for the house. I'm not going to lose it. If I lose my house, I'm killing myself, period, because my house is made for my children. They're going to go to school. The college fund is going to be there for them. I'm going to secure that house. I'm going to do anything I can. If I fail, I kill myself, period. It's not, I'm not looking for for somebody for my life, but this is what I believe. If I do lose my house, I will kill myself because my house is for my kids. I got four kids. That's my future. That's my future. And then I'm not going to play with them. I don't mess around. I work hard seven days a week, no less than 12 hours a day. There is no way to find a job. There is no way to find a driver. There is no way to find anything. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And, and we know that what you are describing uh, is not only it's not something unique. It's not only about your situation. We know because very often we get the email, we get a phone call. And I know that sitting here in this room, we have other that they've been dealing with the same situation that is holding as much as they can. But we are committed to work, and that's why also the package of bill that we also uh, are discussing today are bill that we hope again that working together we can expedite as soon as possible working the administration to put a solution to that crisis. So with that, thank you. And now we're going to be calling the Tax and Limousine Commission, who uh, they will come and testify. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. So 
Let me also acknowledge that we've been joined by all the council members, Rivera, Powers, Riches, Reynoso, Kelo, Yeager, and now I ask the committee council to administer the affirmation and then invite the TLC, the TLC commission, hey, I'm sorry, the TLC representative to deliver the opening statement. So we've been joined by William Henser, Acting Commissioner of Tax and Limousine, yeah, and Christopher Wilson, Deputy Commissioner of Legal Affairs. Thank you for your services, and you know, it's a tough day for all of us, and I know that nothing here is personal, but it's about addressing a crisis that we are committed all together to put a solution. Please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do. I do. Thank you. Good morning, Chair Torres. Good morning, Chair Rodriguez and members of the Oversight and Investigations Committee and members of the Transportation Committee. My name is Bill Hines and I'm the Acting Commissioner of the New York City Taxi and Limousine Commission. And I want to thank you for inviting me today to testify about the medallion crisis about TLC's regulation and licensing of medallion taxi cabs, and to share TLC's views on the uh, legislation that is before us today. With me today is Chris Wilson, who is TLC's Deputy Commissioner for Legal Affairs. The first thing I want to say today is that the testimony that we just heard from Mr. Olayu is unfortunately testimony that is common Rather, the sentiments are common to everyone who works at the TLC. Every day, TLC employees interact with members, with drivers and other licensees. Every, certainly on a regular basis, every employee interacts with them. Daily, people do in licensing, in inspection, in external affairs. I meet with them on a regular basis. We have hearings, we have TLC commission hearings. We hear the pain on a regular basis. We do hear it. It does affect us very deeply, these stories, and all of the stories that we've heard and the pain that the families are feeling. It can be, um, speaking for myself, it has at times uh, when I have heard the driver has killed himself or herself. It is devastating. It, it can be overwhelming. Um, I know from my own experience uh, to a loss of suicide that it is perhaps the worst thing that can happen to someone and the worst thing that can happen to a family. I would say that uh, anyone who thinks that they uh, are doing their children a favor because people will be better off without them is wrong. I would encourage you to uh, immediately seek assistance. We have people here today who can help you, but obviously the city has a wide range of mental health services through Thrive. I want to talk today about the TLC's mission, which is to ensure safe, accessible, and reliable for hire transportation options for every new, new Yorker in every neighborhood. Under this administration, New York City has become a national leader in the regulation of for hire transportation through innovative ways to measure and control the impact of the app companies to ensure that passengers with disabilities have access to the full range of for hire transportation services, to make sure that drivers have a voice and that they are heard and to provide economic protections for drivers that have yielded real victories for workers who have suffered from being categorized as independent contractors, not entitled to the full range of employment benefits in the gig economy. Much of this progress has been made in partnership with you, City Council. Um, we have been asked by City Council to shorten 
our testimony, which I would say is something that in 15 years of preparing for hearings, I've never been asked, I've never heard of. Um, I thought it was a hearing. However, we will shorten that testimony in order I, you know, that I feel the need other to drivers to that. can be heard. Uh, Commissioner, I just want to, it, it's unusual to have 17 pages of testimony, so in the interest of time, that's why we've asked you to summarize. This it. is an oversight hearing on a serious issue with four intros. Commissioner, how long will that, will that take if you read the testimony as you have originally? I would think 10 minutes. Okay, ready. Much of the progress that we have made in, uh, to help drivers has been a direct result of the partnership between the administration and the city council. Under the charter, the city council obviously has an oversight role over all city agencies, including the TLC. But to a greater extent than with many other agencies, the council's relationship with TLC is larger than just oversight. Council plays an important role in setting the agency's regulatory priorities. TLC has nine commissioners appointed by the mayor with the advice and consent of the council, one of whom serves as chair. Of these nine, the city council has a direct role in the appointment of five commissioners, in other words, a majority of the commission, each of whom resides in one of the city's five boroughs and must have the support of the borough delegation before nomination by the mayor and confirmation by the council. We regulate the industry through rulemaking, which we do at regular meetings according to the Citywide Administrative Procedure Act, but the Council also regulates the industry by local law, and you have often required us uh, not only set our priorities, but you have often required us uh, to do specific rulemaking. In this way, the Council has created specific license categories. You've set penalties for violations by licensees, and you've authorized the sale of medallions at times. The Council has also ordered studies and task forces to address and measure issues it finds to have a critical impact on the city's four higher industries. In the past year, the Council has required us to set up an Office of Inclusion, which we've done to offer driver assistance services, which we did and which we have deepened um, to study uh, the impact of the four higher vehicle industry on congestion and driver income citywide and to come up with solutions for that, which we've done. So during regular hearings, through legislation and in meetings with individual members, the Council has always made clear to the TLC its preferred priorities for this agency, and you've let us know when you think that we've got something wrong. But our TLC regulatory authority does have limits. We write license and regulate medallion owners. We do not regulate the lending industry, including banks and credit unions who wrote, refinanced, and hold medallion loans. We do regulate persons and entities who have played a role in connecting buyers with medallion sellers. And therefore, at Mayor de Blasio's direction, TLC, the Department of Finance, and the Department of Consumer Affairs have undertaken a 45-day review to, under, to evaluate the role that brokers played in the medallion crisis, to identify any broker misconduct, and to consider new, more stringent regulations that can identify and prevent potential conflicts that may put medallion buyers and sellers at a disadvantage. The TLC now licenses over 205,000 drivers and 135,000 vehicles who safely and reliably transport over a million passengers a day. The taxi medallion, as Ms. Desai said, was created in 1937 by the ha ha Haas Act. It conveys the exclusive right to pick up street hails throughout the five boroughs. The city, um, the Haas Act set the number of allowable uh, taxi licenses when it created the medallion system. It also allowed for the transfer of medallions between owners. And this transferability, combined with the limit on the overall number of medallions, is core to the market value of the medallion. The city may auction up new medallions only after state or city council authorization. For many years, the number of medallions has remained consistent at 11,787. But since 1996, when the council approved the first modern auction of 400 new medallion licenses, these sales have raised the number of, raised the number of licenses to 12,000. Through subsequent auctions, that number has increased, and today the number is 13,587. That most increase came about as a result of the 2012 Hale Law. The Hale Law was a state law that was done in response 
to findings that the existing taxicab system in New York City um, did not have sufficient capacity to serve citywide and did not have a sufficient number of wheelchair accessible vehicles. At the time, there were 233 wheelchair accessible vehicles. Today, there are 10 times that many. So those auctions were scheduled. They did occur. They occurred in 2013 and the early parts of 2014. Although by 2014, Uber, Lyft, and Juno had begun operating in New York City, the app's initial growth was in fact slow until around 2015. While the TLC lacked the authority to limit the number of for hire vehicle licenses, they have always operated subject to the city's for hire vehicle licenses. And I really want to underline this because this is something that we as an agency and we as council and the administration and we as a city should be incredibly proud of. Unlike any other city, we strongly and strictly regulate the app companies here. This has taken time. Over the years, we have got to a point where we require more data on, on trips and fair payment than any other city, not just in the country, any other city in the world. We now require the app companies to pay an actual living income to their drivers. This is 85,000 drivers. This was done in partnership with City Council through Councilman Landers' legislation last year. You required us to study it. You required us to rule make. We did both. We did it. And now app drivers, 85,000 of our TLC drivers, have earned at least $172 million in, in extra money. This is not done anywhere else, not just in the country, nowhere else in the world. We heard often from the medallion industry. We heard at TLC, the administration heard, and I know you heard at City Council, we heard often that it wasn't fair that the apps had different rules than the wheelchair um, rather than the yellow industry. So we've looked at those rules. In many instances, we have evened and, and made uniform those requirements. We've done that through rule. You've done that through local law. We've worked together on doing that so that the one big thing we heard was the app companies don't have to provide wheelchair accessible service, and we do. We agreed it wasn't fair for one sector to have that responsibility and for one sector, which had grown tremendously to over 80,000 vehicles, to not have that responsibility. So in fact, we imposed that requirement. We heard often from the yellow industry that it wasn't fair and it wasn't right that there was no limit on the number of for hire vehicle licenses so the app companies could grow and grow and grow. And I know you heard that as well and in 2015 we almost got there. We didn't get there. That legislation didn't happen. But it did happen in 2018. So we've done that together. So I think in fact uh, the TLC has made incredible progress and has done, taken many concrete acts that are designed to even the playing field to make sure that all sectors are carrying their burden um, equally. So the increasing competition from the apps was not the sole cause of the medallion values decline, but the eventual steep decline in yellow taxi trips has resulted in real economic loss, as we heard earlier, and has impacted medallion owners' ability to make loan payments and to support their families. Analysis of Fairbox fair data demonstrates this. When you look at the revenue a driver takes home, excluding taxes and fees, the decline per cab is significant, and it's well over the 10 percent that has been reported, as Ms. Desai said. This decline is only part of the story for medallion owners. Not only have they lost passengers when they're driving their cab, they've also lost the lease income of second and third shift drivers who previously leased cabs during those times when the owners and drivers were not working. In evaluating how this crisis occurred and what more might have been done to help the traditional for hire industries, it is important to look at the role of TLC but it is also important, as, as the witnesses before me have testified, to look at the role of the large medallion owners who impacted the market, the banks and the credit unions who finance and refinance taxi medallions, and the financial regulatory agencies with oversight of those institutions. Medallions sold at auction 
do represent a portion of all medallion purchases, but as mentioned previously, because the House Act made medallions transferable, meaning that they're an asset that could be bought and sold, there was created a secondary market for medallions. The purchase price of these uh, private sales, as you know, is subject to a city transfer tax, which is now 0.5%. TLC is the agency that reviews and approves the transfer of medallions from one owner or entity to another, whether that is by auction or the secondary market. And this review consists of review of several documents, including information about the person or persons who are buying the medallion, whether they're a human, whether they are officers, shareholders, partners, or members. The purchasing party is subjected to a criminal background check. All parties to the transaction, if the person is selling their also a licensee, they have also been submitted to a criminal background check. What we receive is a commitment letter which demonstrates that the purchaser has the funding necessary that is a loan to sell. What we have never received are the actual loan documents that go into that purchase. We don't, uh, we don't look, we don't have the documents that a bank or credit union had before it when it determined to make that loan. The power to oversee those lending institutions and to set role, rules for evaluating whether to make loans for the terms of those loans, uh, terms of those, sorry, whether to make rules for the, or the terms of those loans lies with state and federal agencies. First, the New York State Department of Financial Services, as was earlier testified, is a primary regulator for all state licensed and state chartered banks, credit unions, mortgage bankers, and brokers. All mortgage loan servicers doing business in New York must be registered and licensed. They, that department investigates and prosecutes fraud, and they work with law enforcement and other regulatory agencies. Another government entity with regulatory oversight of the banks that held medallion loans was the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, or FDIC, an independent federal agency that insures deposits in U.S. banks. In order to minimize losses to their insurance fund, the FDIC examines and supervises the process of all FDIC-insured financial institutions for safety and soundness. But the regulator with the most power over taxi medallion loans, and the only regulator that direct, directly impacting the financial stability of many drivers today is the National Credit Union Administration, or the NCUA. This is an independent federal agency created by Congress to leg regulate, charter, and supervise federal credit unions. At the height of the medallion prices, credit unions held New York City taxi medallion loans valued in excess over two and a half billion dollars. After the failure of three credit unions heavily concentrated in taxi medallion loans, Melrose Credit Union, Lomto Federal Credit Union, and Bay Ridge Federal Credit Union, the NCUA Office of Inspector General reviewed the actions of these institutions, their boards, and the NCUA's own regulators to determine the causes of the credit union's failure and the resulting estimated seven, $765.5 million loss to the National Credit Union Share Insurance Fund and also to assess the supervision by the NCUA of the credit unions. In March of 2019, the NCUA self-audit report found that the credit unions failed due to deeply flawed lending practices, weak board oversight, and risky management decisions. The report found that credit unions often fail to do even the most basic analysis of borrowers' ability to repay the loan. These lending practices impacted not only purchasers, but all medallion owners. Set up as short-term balloon loans, borrowers were, were required to go to their lenders each time the loan became fully due, typically after three years, to refinance these loans for another term. At each refinancing, borrowers were made aware of the current value of their medallion on the market, and they were informed that they could borrow against the equity in their medallion. In other words, I believe that they were encouraged to cash out of their loans and to receive immediate funds, which were, of course, added on top of the principal they already owed and was subject then to a new interest rate. So the growing value of the medallion allowed many hardworking families to borrow against the equity in their medallion to purchase a home for their family and to put their kids through college. However, the result is that today, 
Many owners we speak to, regardless of when they purchase their medallion at what price, owe as much as $600,000 and in some cases more. Although loan examiners for the, uh, uh, for the NCUA documented these unsound lending practices, the credit unions refused to address the examiner's concerns. The reasons for inaction were varied, but one fact from the report to me I think illustrates the larger problem. After a law firm was hired to perform an internal investigation, they determined that the CEO of Melrose Credit Union had authorized spending of over $1.3 million of credit union funds on sports tickets for his friends and family over a five-year period. Most troubling, however, were the findings of the audit related to the NCUA's inaction in response to loan examiner's findings. That audit revealed that NCUA was available of the unsound lending practices as far back as October of 2011. However, they took no action until April 2014, only after the medallion market began showing signs of weakness when it released a supervisory letter which it, w it was intended to establish a consistent framework for the examination and supervision that field staff used to review loans secured by taxi medallions. But instead of calling for the lending institutions to work with borrowers to right-size loans to appropriate balances that could be supported by their income, the guidance called for the opposite. Specifically, NCUA instructed lending institutions to shorten their amortization period if industry volatility was evident or expected. For medallion owners and drivers, this meant that as the value of medallions began to fall, the NCUA directed lenders to shorten the amortization schedule, therefore increasing drivers' monthly loan payments. The NCUA is particularly important here because it serves not only as a regulator, after having taken over several of the credit unions active in medallion loaning, but also as a direct lender. Today, in fact, the NCUA is almost certainly the holder of the largest number of medallion loans, and thus it is the NCUA that is deciding whether or not to provide financial relief to many of our drivers. Based on our outreach to drivers, it is the institutions that are now controlled by them that have been the most aggressive with drivers during this challenging period. Bill, sorry, Un will you mind to summarize because it's been like 20 minutes. Okay. So under former Commissioner Zoshi and continuing today, the TLC has regularly met with lenders as well as the NCUA to advocate for borrower relief. The TLC has, on a regular basis, raised the concern about medallion loans and has urged medallion loan lenders and the NCUA to write down the loans and to allow people to borrow in amounts and at rates that would allow them to continue to operate and to make payments on a right-sized loans. I know that some lending institutions are beginning to modify those loans, but our driver outreach tells us that most have not received any relief, and for those that are, often the relief does not go far enough. I hope that together we can continue to advocate for lenders to right-size these loans and for the regulators to require that they take these steps if they refuse. Writing down loan principles to a level supported by the income a dri cab driver actually earns would provide immediate le relief to drivers, as well as stability to the medallion industry. As I mentioned, uh, as I mentioned in my written testimony, uh, we have taken several steps to address this, and I listed some of those steps earlier. I want to point out that the mayor has also directed that the existing driver assistance centers services that were established by local law last year by city council be expanded and located in a permanent driver assistance center. So in addition to that broker review, the mayor has also, um, in addition to the broker review, review we're doing, we will have a permanent location for drivers to come in with access to the full range of city services, with access to financial counseling, uh, including dedicated consumer credit professionals who will be there to help and to go with them to the lenders and to help them advocate for right-sizing the loans for loan relief. We will also deep continue to make uh, drivers um, aware of and make contacts to services that are available to them through other city programs. Yes, including Thrive, the mental health services program. Also, we'll have a dedicated staffer there from the Human Resources Administration who will make them 
can make immediate connections to a range of benefit, city benefits that are available for people who are in economic or other types of pain. The mayor right, is also to wrap, if I, Bill, if, Bill, we need to wrap it up. The mayor has also directed that the TLC expand its capacity to conduct ongoing reviews of our licensees, and we intend to do that through a new business practices accountability unit. That unit's mission will be to protect TLC drivers, medallion owners, and other licensees from dangerous and unfair industry practices by businesses that fall under TLC regulation. The accountability team will be tasked with increasing accountability and transparency of business practices in the for hire transportation sector. To promote sound business practices, the accountability unit will collaborate with agency partners to investigate violations of TLC rules and relevant local, state, or federal regulations. We will expand the 45-day study of broker practices to the other TLC licensed businesses and undertake a comprehensive review of our existing rules governing those TLC licensed business conduct to identify areas where new regulations are needed to protect drivers. This will be fully incorporated into TLC operations and into the policy making and decision making process at the agency and working with other divisions within TLC including licensing, prosecution and external affairs. We will work on any necessary revisions to the licensure and renewal process and assist in the investigation of any rule violations by TLC licensed businesses and educating their drivers of their rights when working with a TLC licensed business. You've asked me to summarize. I just want to say, in summary, I want to thank you for the opportunity to appear today. And I just want to say that in answer um, to the question of what has TLC done, again, I think we have done a tremendous amount. We have reduced the taxes and fees on medallions. We've just announced that the re we're waiving collection of the uh, renewal fee. We've increased the amount of money available to wheelchair accessible medallion owners and drivers. We've taken control of the streets back from the apps. We've made sure that the app companies bear their fair share of responsibilities. We've capped the number of for hire vehicle licenses to allow us to study and determine what that number should be. We've subjected the app companies to um, income requirements that require them to pay 85,000 drivers a living income in this city. So I think that in fact we have done a tremendous amount and we have done a tremendous amount to level the playing field. And I believe that these are, as I said, shared victories with City Council. And when I say we, I really mean we. And I think our work continues, but that does mean that we need to continue to work together. When I uh, testified at the budget hearing in May, Chair Drum and Chair uh, Rodriguez were very clear that they thought that there was a uh, leaf had been, uh, a page had been turned from most of the unproductive actions of last year um, by a prior committee, and I take them at their word that they want to work together, and I hope you know that we want to work together, and I think we have always always been ready to work with City Council and have worked with City Council. Thank you. Thank you, and the questions of vote for this section will be lead by the co-chair, Councilmember Richard Torres, which committed that he chair the Oversight Investigation Committee had been working for months on these issues. But before we get into those questions, I just want to highlight it that the way or how I will call TLC not to rush on the voting on rules, it, on things that are connected to the report, the report that was supposed to be due in August, a report as a chairman of the Committee of Transportation that I chair, the oversight TLC, I only get to see that report the evening before the announcement. So I feel that in the spirit of working together, when a type of report that is a, there's a result, or the work and that came out from a bill that we voted here as a council should deserve enough time for us to have any discussion before that information is used to now move and vote on any rules. Councilmember Torres. Thank you. If I could just respond to that, um, if I could just address that point, uh, Chair Rodriguez. Um, 
Absolutely, we're open to discussions. Absolutely, we're in the rulemaking process now. We have a month before that hearing. That, that's a public hearing that's held under the city's Administrative Procedure Act. That's held at 33 Beaver Street on the 19th floor at noon on July 20, 23rd. Everyone is welcome to testify. We will take, we, we, we do meet, we will meet with stakeholders before that hearing. Um, just as a reminder though, the, the August deadline is also when the current vehicle license cap expires. And so that is the deadline that is um, impelling all of us to act quickly. But any chair of this committee, in this case, my case, the chair of this committee, get a copy of that report the evening before the announcement is not acceptable. Councilman Mentor. Good morning, Commissioner. Good morning. Um, how, long have you, how long have each of you been at TLC? I've been at TLC uh, since August of 2015. And I've been at, I've been at TLC since uh, February 2006. 2006. I, it felt to me like your testimony seemed to blame the state regulators, the federal regulators, even the city council, and you you, you, you spoke as if the TLC and the city council is very much a partnership, but uh, did the city council have access to the Roth report until three hours ago? I don't believe so. But TLC had that report since 2011 or 2010, correct? I, I can tell you that that report just surfaced very recently. The how how far I back does that report date? Uh, I believe it's either 2010 or 2011. 2011, and the report warns about manipulation of the medallion market. It warns about the risk of a medallion market collapse. So that's information so here's to what which, I know about let me the finish, report. that's information to which TLC, unlike the city council, had access. I just want to be clear about that. We requested the report three weeks ago and we received it three hours ago, but Feel free to respond. As I said, that report was not available to, to me or to anyone that I know of until very recently. The, the, uh, the, it's not a report, that document, um, which is a, as you've seen, is a very brief memo, um, first came to light last week. That's the first time I saw that document. Um, your committee had we had started looking for it in connection with the New York Times article. We were unable to find it. I know that your committee asked us to look for it more about two weeks ago in June. We did look for it. We looked very hard, and it was located in archived email database going back to the prior administration. I want to, can we put up exhibit one? Is this one as in the quote from the mayor? Not the Roth report. So recently on Brian, on Brian Lear's show, when asked about a potential bailout for yellow cab medallion owners, the mayor said, quote, the challenge is that this is a private market reality. We put the medallions out there. People, people made a decision of whether to buy them or not. The minute we saw the market was in a bad place, we shut down the medallion sales. That's the power we had. What, what exactly does the mayor mean by a, quote, private market reality? Can you define that for me? I, I would, A, I didn't make that comment. Okay. Um, B, I would need to see the full comment to really yeah. talk about it. So I can't, tell you what he, I can't tell you what someone else's intention was when they said sure. something. So what, what troubles me about that comment is that it, it sounds like an attempt by the mayor to wash the city's hands of responsibility. But the fact is what the I mayor does. I don't think that that's, let, that's let, not consistent with all let, of his let, actions. Let me finish all my, of the actions let, Commissioner, let me finish my point, mayor. and then you can respond. But what the, what the mayor describes as a private market reality, as you know, does not exist in a vacuum. It exists within a regulatory scheme that TLC, that the city completely controls the medallion market, is a New York City creation. I noticed in your testimony you were quick to blame the state regulators, the federal regulators, even the city council. I'm wondering if TLC or even the city at large feels any measure of culpability for the medallion market collapse 
and the humanitarian crisis that has resulted from it. If you, you're asking if if you're asking if I feel sorry and if people at TLC feel sorry about you, the pain. Do you feel moral culpability? Absolutely, no moral culpability. I feel very much pain, and I feel sorrow for the people who have gone through this. Did TLC do enough to prevent the bubble? I can't speak to what TLC might have done back then. I can tell you what we've done since since the mayor became the mayor. Well, the general counsel has been here for two, from, since from 2006. Do you feel the city, do the he TLC did enough counsel to prevent the bubble? Time. I was in general counsel till 2014. What was your position in 2006? I was an assistant general counsel. Okay, that's a significant position. Do you think TLC did enough to prevent the bubble? I don't have an opinion on that. You don't have an opinion on it, okay. Do you think the TLC had a role in creating the bubble? Is that question directed to me? I'm yeah, but, yeah, either or. Here's what I can tell you. I can tell you that I can't speak to the motivations of the people here who were here before me. I can tell you everything that we have done to address the medallion crisis. I can tell you the things we have done to try to help the yellow no, industry no, we're, we're going to explore. We're going to help them Commissioner, directly. you I don't answer you whatever what questions you want to answer. Saved. You respond to the questions that I ask. We will explore the solutions later on. I'm asking, do you feel TLC had any role in creating the speculative bubble in the medallion market, the bubble that led to mass foreclosures and mass bankruptcies and suicides and suffering? Do you think TLC had a role in creating that bubble? It's a straightforward question. What I'm trying to do and what I've done in my testimony is to provide the context that I think is lacking, which is to show all of the market players here, all of the, all of the forces at play here in terms of the medallion market. The medallion, as you know, is a transferable asset. It has been a transferable asset for, I guess, 60 or 70 years, well, actually 80 years now. The TLC um, has a role in terms of reviewing transfer documents. But if you're asking me whether TLC is responsible for all of these banks writing all of these loans and these credit unions writing unsound loans, no. Do you think the, the lenders had a role in creating the bubble? Yes. Do you think the federal regulators had a role in creating the bubble? As I, as I said, if I read this report, which yeah. I encourage everyone to read sure. from March 2019, they themselves lay the blame at themselves for a lukewarm response to okay. the problem. So the federal regulators had a role. What about the state regulators? Did the state regulators have a role? Uh, as Ms. Desai testified, and I'm not aware of this, but she felt that there were um, documents or, okay. or that were available to them and things that they could have done better. So we know the brokers, the lenders, the speculators are to blame. We know the state and federal regulators are to blame. Everyone is to blame except the city regulator, TLC, even though the medallion is controlled by your agency. Uh, I want to get to the question of relief. I will come back later to the question of culpability. Suppose for a moment you have a million dollar loan and suppose you have a medallion worth $200,000. The excess debt is $800,000. When it comes to relief for the individual driver owners, the city has essentially two options. The city can either pay the excess debt or pressure the lender to write down the loan or some combination of the two. Is the, will, is the city willing to pay the excess debt? What I've said is, what I said in my testimony, is that we think that you need to focus on who has the power and who has the money here. The people who have the power and the money here are the banks and the credit unions that hold those loans, and they should be the ones who should be forced to write down those loans to something that is human and possible to pay, and they should be forced to write down the monthly payments and at interest rates, again, that are affordable and at periods that make sense and that are not predatory. So since the city is not willing to pay the excess debt, have you even attempted to pressure the lenders to write down the loans? As I said, uh, going back a few years, 
Uh, Commissioner Zoshi and other people at TLC have met with lenders. It, it did, did in fact have, did actually meet with the NCUA, I wasn't at that meeting, uh, and urged them to do so. And we've raised this issue pretty repeatedly in public settings at city council hearings, at TLC commission hearings, in press interviews. Now, you're, you're, you're presently the commissioner. Have you met with any of the lenders? Have you directly pressured lenders to write down the loans? We did. Uh, there was a roundtable with some, there was a meeting with some lenders. When yes. was that meeting? I don't remember. It was in the which, last. Which meeting. lenders were present? Really, sorry? Which lenders were present at the meeting? I don't have, I, I, I will get you the list. What about it legal was probably, It was probably two months ago. I've been, com I've been acting for three months, and it was when I was acting. So that, that's the only way I can narrow it right now. What about the proposal for legal representation? Is the city willing to provide each medallion owner with a lawyer who will advocate for them and pressure lenders to modify the loan? I think uh, uh, in some sense, uh, a right to counsel for medallion owners. Mm -hmm. Um, we're, what we're looking at is providing a pretty wide range of service and credit ad, and credit advocates. Um, the whole the whole package is still being planned, but it's going to it's going to require um, finding space and making sure we have sufficient staff assigned to it, and making sure we have contracts with different vendors. So, really, everything is under consideration. I'm not sure right if I'm now. understanding. So, this the TLC is willing to fund legal representation for medallion orders? That's not what I said. Okay, I so said, that my I question was about legal representation for medallion orders, whether you're willing to pay for each medallion order to have an attorney who will advocate for them and pressure the lenders to renegotiate the loans. Is that a service that the city is willing to provide? The city, uh, what we're willing to do is to provide credit advocates, who people who are skilled in consumer financing, consumer credit issues, and to go and to advocate with the banks. It doesn't have to be an attorney who goes and advocates with a bank or a credit union to downsize or reduce, right size or reduce a loan. But you're not willing to provide them with legal assistance? I'm not saying I'm not willing to provide them with that. It's not, it's not, as far as I know, it's not in the plan right now, but we're still very much planning out this office. Among individual driver owners, what's the total amount of, of excess debt? I don't know, but I can get that for you. Uh, I feel like you should know the answer to that question. Like, how could you not know the answer to a question whose stakes are a matter of life and death? You have owners who have committed suicide. You have owners whose lives have been decimated by foreclosures and bankruptcies. You have owners who have lost their livelihood. <laughs> have lost you have owners who have lost their livelihood lost their retirement who without relief are going or condemned to be indentured servants for the rest of their lives like are you telling me that TLC does not take the suffering of all these drivers seriously enough of course not to, uh, to know the total not. amount of excess debt that has been tormenting these drivers of course, that's not what I'm saying, and you know that's not what I'm saying. Well, you should know the answer to that we question. But, but one thing that we have said very publicly, and I think that members of the public know this, and I think members of the city council know this, is we don't have a full insight into all the loans that are written. If we know the amount of a loan that was written at an initial, at a transfer of a medallion, but as you know, much of the problem has stemmed from refinancing, and that is not reported to TLC. Yeah. Although I think we're going to explore the question of financial stability, and I suspect you have the authority to request the loans as a condition for receiving the medallion. But I want to get to, back to the question of culpability, specifically on advertising. Uh, did the city engage in misleading advertising about the value of the medallions, particularly at the expense of immigrants who aspire to the American dream? I can't characterize the advertising, but it's... Well, it's I guess I'll character we'll characterize it for you. Exhibit two. So here's a TLC advertisement that says that the medallion is, quote, better than the stock market. Mm -hmm. Former Commissioner Matthew Dallas, the medallion has outperformed practically every other type of investment that exists. So TLC gave the false impression that the medallion... TLC gave the impression 
that the medallion transcends the fluctuations of the stock market, that the price of the medallion would keep rising. Can we get to the next slide? And you gave the medallion that the, the you gave the impression that the medallion was a path to the American dream, right? Home ownership, higher education, a, a worry-free retirement, quote, worry-free retirement. Do you think it's misleading for the city to associate a medallion with a, quote, worry-free retirement? Is that the kind of language that a city regulator should be using? So I note that all of this advertising occurred, in, this occurred, not all of it, but the two things you've shown me occurred in 2004 and 2010. I really can't speak to the motivation of the decision makers at TLC in 2010 or at 2004. Is that the kind of advertising that you would have done if you were the commissioner at the time? I... Would you use terms like worry-free retirement? I have a pretty, when it comes to finances and my own personal finances, I have a pretty conservative outlook. So I would like to think I would not have used or approved those type of terms. Yeah. I want to get to the question of financial stability. Does TLC have a responsibility to ensure the financial stability of the medallion market and your licensees? I think the TLC has a responsibility to do as much as we can to help all of our licensees, including but the medallion licensees. But specifically on the question of financial, financial stability, are you responsible for the financial stability of the medallion market? Again, let, let me, let me answer that. that let me, I'll answer that question for you. Exhibit four, please. Can you read uh, chapter 52 of your own rules, section four? I'm not going to, I'm not going to read that. I'm aware I'll that read, that's I'll read it rules. for you. Establish and enforce standards to ensure all licensees are and remain yeah. financially stable. So, yeah. me, yes, thank you. I'm, uh, I'm aware of that provision. I'm aware that we've been right. sued on it many times, and we may, in fact, it may, in fact, be the subject of current litigation. Sure. It is. Do you, do you, so speaking of lending, do you agree that a, a predatory loan undermines the financial stability? of your licensees of the medallion market. Would you agree with that proposition? I would agree with the proposition that someone who has a predatory loan, has been the victim of a predatory loan, is not in a financially stable situation. And yet, even though you have the, resp the statutory responsibility for the financial stability of the market, TLC had the authority to deny a license to an owner who had a predatory loan. So again, uh, you could have, excuse again, me, let me finish my point. You, you right could now. have, you, you had the authority to deny a license to an owner whose debt was unpayable. And as a result of TLC's failure to exercise that authority, there are 950 owners who have filed for bankruptcy. There are thousands more who are drowning in debt, who have been condemned to indentured servitudes. So you're correct that you do not directly regulate lending but you can have an impact on lending standards because you control the medallion. There is no medallion loan without the medallion which you ultimately control. And these loans are far more predatory than people realize. Let's go to exhibits five and six. So here is a loan that dates back to 2016. It's a recent loan. And here's the statement about the collateral of the loan. Quote, all of debtors New York City taxi cab licenses and medallions, whether now owned or hereafter acquired, all personal property now owned or hereafter acquired by the debtor. So this loan, which dates back to 2016, collateralizes not only the medallion, it collateralizes everything a borrower will own in the present and everything a borrower will ever own in the future, right? This loan represents lifelong financial enslavement. These were the kind of predatory loans that were circulating and destabilizing the medallion market which your agency regulates. I want to get to the question of, of auctions. TLC, let's go to Exhibit 7. TLC, by the way, have you ever seen that kind of loan before? A loan that collateralizes literally everything that you will ever own? Have you seen that loan before? I haven't seen this, I haven't seen this document. I'd want to see the entire okay. document. We'll be happy to share I don't with think you. I, I, don't, I don't think I have uh, seen, I don't, no, I don't know that I've seen a loan like that before. Yeah. But. I've never seen a loan that literally collateralizes everything you will ever own in your life. Exhibit 7. 
uh, TLC began the practice of auctioning off medallions under Mayor Giuliani and then took the practice to new extremes under Mayor Bloomberg. The Giuliani administration held three, act, three auctions and sold 400 medallions. The Bloomberg administration held 16 auctions and sold 1,260 medallions. The de Blasio administration held two auctions and sold 200 medallions. During an auction, let's get to the next slide. During an auction in February 2014, the de Blasio administration set the upset price at $650,000. The maximum winning bid was $965,000, nearly a million dollars. As you know, the November 2013 and February 2014 auctions were catastrophic for participants, so catastrophic that 40% of the participants in the February 2014 auction went bankrupt. And so my question is, do you regret the November 2014 auction? I regret that any, anyone who participated in that auction would experience any pain at all. I regret that. I'm sorry about that. No, I'm happy that you regret pain in the world. That's great. But do you regret the decision to conduct the auction, which led to 40% of the participants becoming bankrupt? So what I know about the context of, the, of these auctions is that they were done at a certain time, and they were done in large part uh, as authorized by state law to increase the number of wheelchair accessible medallions on the street. Um, obviously, in this administration, the auctions stopped almost immediately, and I can tell you what this administration has done since that time to but you stabilize had the, you the had the ability market. to shut down that 2014 auction. It happened under the de Blasio administration. You had the authority to forego that auction, correct? Again, these auctions were established in 2013. Two of them were held in 2014. So I can tell you, I can't tell you the motivation about establishing these auctions. I can tell you everything that we've done since that time to help the medallion sector and to help all of the drivers. But by 2014, TLC knew or should have known that there was a speculative bubble in the medallion market. And by 2014, TLC knew or should have known that ride-hailing platforms like Uber and Lyft were disrupting the market and threatening to burst a bubble a decade in the making. Given what you knew or should have known, was it not irresponsible to auction off medallions for nearly a million dollars in February of 2014? So I don't know what information was in front of the people at the time they made that decision. I do know that if I look back and if I look at the trip numbers for yellow and if I look at fare box for yellow, they were at or near record highs. Let's, uh, can we have the, can we pull up the NACUR slide? That's exhibit 19. So this was immediately after, this was around the same time as the February 2014 auction, April 1st. Uh, NACUA observed speculation in the market. It said the limited supply of medallions available in the market can lead to a speculative premium, which occurs when the sales price of a medallion exceeds the value that is supported by the medallion's ability to generate net operating income, citing as one example, individual and corporate medallion prices in New York City increased by 2.5 times and 3.3 times respectively between 2004 and 2012. Fair and lease rates in New York City remain unchanged between 2006 and 2012. As you know, the astronomical rise in the medallion vi values could not be explained by fair or lease rates alone. It was primarily explained by debt not by rising incomes or rising revenues, but by debt. That was a sign that there was a bubble, and TLC knew that there was a bubble because the Roth report said as much. The Roth report said that there was speculation in the medallion market. So with the Roth document, I think, as I've said before, and I'm going to keep saying, I don't know why it was written, and I don't know what information people, uh, I don't know what people did with that, that document. Right. Well, I did nothing. Uh, I obviously, obviously, I don't think it's fair to say that TLC has done nothing. TLC has worked um, extremely, extremely hard over the past few years to 
uh, help drivers, to help owners, to help the entire industry. And it has been difficult, and it hasn't always been successful, of course. But we've given a tremendous, we've been given a tremendous amount to do, and I think we've done it really well. We were just given the power by you last year to cap the number of vehicle licenses. That was something we never had. That was a huge missed opportunity in 2015. I think that could have staunched a lot of the problems here, not all of them, but a lot of them. And, and we all missed that opportunity, but we took that back and we did it in 2018. And as I said, we've leveled the playing field. We've required the app companies to shoulder the burden of operating, of having the privilege to operate and carry passengers in New York City. So we have subjected them to rules from the beginning, and we've expanded that, and we've subjected them to, uh, to data requirements, again, unlike any other city in the country. Wheelchair accessible requirements, Commissioner, unlike that, any that other city That has nothing to do with what I'm asking about. That's not, it's irrelevant to the subject of this city. hearing. Um, you are correct. I think it's very relevant. You are correct. Oh, I think it's, it's very relevant. Oh. I think it should. I think it is the subject of this hearing. The subject of the hearing. The subject of the, the, subject hearing, of the hearing is are all these drivers who do not have the worry-free retirement that you promised them. That's the subject of this hearing. But I want to. Now you're and correct that TLC does not act out of its own volition. TLC, Commissioner, taken, let me finish. If you look at the Commissioner, steps, let me no, finish. You just, you just Commissioner. made an accusation. If you look at the steps that we have taken. Yeah. Since 2014, to say TLC that we have to done nothing the to help uh, the, to help financially drivers in the city is simply untrue. You, you can ask and the I drivers. Will, I will, I will we, go to the we, end. Sure. I will defend my record, um, and I will defend TLC's um, record. I'm incredibly proud of that record. Should. Okay. I'm incredibly. Um, uh, it's just I'll. I'll conclude my first round of questioning just by pointing out it seems to me the city not only TLC but the city has the same perverse incentives as the predatory brokers and the lenders and speculators just like the brokers lenders and speculators were willing to destabilize the medallion market to generate short-term profits the city including TLC the regulator was willing to do the same to generate short-term revenues uh, and that to me is disgraceful. So I, I'll, I'll conclude my first round of questions. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Torres. I would like to also acknowledge that we've been joined by Councilmember Dodge, Espinal, and Levin. Commissioner, in 2014, when the, those medallions were sold, when TLC was uh, advertising, did TLC has any idea that we were in the middle of the devaluation of the value of the medallion? I'm not sure what TLC was aware of in 2014. I wasn't there, and I'm, I'm, I'm not sure what went into that decision-making process. So when you look to, when did you join TLC? 2015. 2015. So now conversation have happened that you've been engaged in TLC about the devaluation of the medallion? I think there were news reports at the time that there were there were issues with some medallion loans that that happened at some point in 2014. Okay, because I feel that one of the concern, which is a legitimate concern, uh, that many of those, especially individual medallion owners, have, especially that groups who bought those medallion in 2014, is that. How much did the city knew about the devaluation of the medallion when the TLC was advertising opportunity for people to buy those medallions? I, I understand the question. I can't give you any insight into what was on people's minds at that time. Okay. How does TLC monitor potential conflict between brokers uh, acting in mu uh, multiple roles in the industry? I'm going to actually ask Chris to answer that because he's more familiar with the broker licensing system. And um, our brokerage 
our brokerage rules do require that um, brokers who have a conflict of interest in a transfer um, disclose those transfers to the parties to the transaction. We're currently undergoing a review of all of the broker documentation for the last three years to determine whether or not those rules were complied with. How many brokers have been denied license or have, or have had their license revoked or suspended uh, based on TLC fitness determination in the past 15 years? And out of how many actions have been brought? We licensed 20 now. I'm not, a, I'm not aware that we've revoked any. No one? I don't think so. Have TLC identify some issue in that area of the fact that no one license has been revoked is because no one is doing anything wrong. Sure, as I said, the mayor has ordered that the TLC in partnership with Department of Consumer uh, Affairs and Labor Relations as well as the Department of Finance undergo a 45-day review of the role of brokers, so we're currently going through that. We're looking at all the documentation we get from brokers, and we're looking at, at whether they have followed the, uh, we, we, to the extent to which they made the disclosure requirements that are necessary that they make to purchasers. We're also looking at, as I'm sure City Council is, or I know they are through the legislation, what further steps can we take to strengthen um, that oversight? Yeah. Ha has TLC received any complaints? about broken brokers from license? There have been complaints, but not as many complaints as you might think. I believe it's a low number. But obviously, they have obviously there have been complaints to other people. There are complaints in the New York Times article. So obviously, there have been people who have complained. How big do you categorize a crisis of the numbers of individual medallions owner going into bankruptcy. Again, I'm not, I can't tell you how many people might be, you're asking me how many people are going into bankruptcy? Right now, from the 6,000 individual medallion owners, how many do I, you know? I wouldn't, I wouldn't know that number of how many people are, are, are on the verge of going into bankruptcy. When there is a transfer as a result of a bankruptcy, then that comes to us. So there could be bankruptcy proceedings now that we're not aware of. Do you think that that number, and I don't want to put you in the spot, but it's based about the information that you have. Do you think that from the 6,000 individual medallion owners, do you think that number raised like to 500, 1,000? I don't know the exact number. I'm, I'm sure that it is very painfully high. So who from TLC is responsible to get those information or who of those individual medallions owner has fill out from for bankruptcy? Again, my understanding is that we would learn about a bankruptcy proceeding unless we are named as a party in a bankruptcy proceeding, which um, may happen mistakenly. My understanding is, and Chris, you should step in. My understanding is we would only learn about a bankruptcy proceeding um, when, it, when uh, the asset uh, needed to be transferred, when the medallion needed to be transferred. So that's when we would find out. We're obviously trying to find out more about this right now. As you know, last year, one of the things that City uh, Council asked us to do was to do a study of medallion and medallion debt. Uh, we've sent out a survey to all medallion owners. We're having these regular meetings. Uh, in all of the boroughs with medallion owners and getting as much information as we possibly can from them. Mm -hmm. How do you see the future of this industry? How do you, what conversation are you having internally about rescuing or helping those men and women, especially from the 15,000, the 6,000 individual medallion owners? Well, we're having a lot of conversations about it, and we've taken a lot of steps. Um, as I said, with the dri there were the driver assistance centers that were set up under Councilman Salamanca's legislation. The mayor just announced, or the services had to be offered. The mayor just announced we're formalizing that into driver assistance centers. 
We just def announced that we're not collecting medallion renewal fees. As you know, through legislation last year, we stopped collecting renewal fees on wheelchair accessible medallions. We're, we're doing this broker review. We're setting up what I described earlier as the business practices accountability unit. So all of these are steps that we're doing to intensify the work, the outreach that we do to drivers, the work we do on their behalf, providing, not only connecting them with available city services, but also providing them with direct services, including credit counseling, people who can go and advocate on their behalf to the credit unions and to the other holders of these loans. Do you think that TLC should be reorganized? Do I think that TLC should be reorganized? I, uh, no, I don't. I think TLC is a very good and strong agency. I think every agency always has things that it can do better. Some of the things we're talking about today, Please, guy. some of the things that are the subject of the legislation that you've introduced, so I don't think it's a question of reorganizing. I think it's a question of examining our priorities. The priorities uh, are set not only by us and by our commissioners, they're set by the mayor, and as I said, they're also set by city council, and you set quite a few for us uh, in the past year. So it may be a question of do we have the resources we need to fulfill all of these. Do you know any about any members that they used to be part of TLC that then later on joined Uber or Lyft? Yes, I'm, I, I am aware that some people who worked at TLC uh, have worked for license, have gone on to work for stakeholders, licensees, however you call them. But not as an investor level, no as a I don't know. No one. Okay. I don't know. H have I, you? I, 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 I don't know the answer to that question. I'd be, I don't know the answer to that question. Okay. Have you looked on any other city? Because you know the situation that is going on in the city of New York is no different from other also municipality. Have you looked at any model in other city on how they've been addressing that situation and putting some ideas on? So we have talked to a few other cities. Um, the, some, there are some other cities that have medallions. We've spoken with Chicago. We've spoken with San Francisco. We spoke with um, even a province in, in Australia uh, that regulated them. My understanding is um, uh, there, were, there have been extreme difficulties in trying to make those systems work. Is there any idea that any of those city have shared with you that you believe that it's something that the city of New York should be look at it, looking at it? Not from what I recall of those ideas, but we're obviously very open to ideas about how to help, how to help the industry and how to help drivers. Okay. I, I know Council Member Le Levin has a question too, but I just want you no, know, for everyone, especially those of you guys at TLC, the team also, the, the mayor's office, everyone should understand that, you know, today's hearing is not about a hearing where the council members uh, and the drivers and the medallion owners are here sharing their frustration. I saw that the city of New York should know that we want the discussion about the past, present, and the future in New York to have today as a day before and the day after. And we need a solution. You know, this cannot, this is not a be yes, another hearing in the history of the Taxi Limousine Commission. So, I, is, I also know, sir, please, I also know that I have a lot of respect for your work and, and, and know, I know that You've been trying to do the best you can, but this is not about an individual. This is about the cultural on how we are operating today. So those of you, those, the members of your team who are here or following this hearing, we will follow up with all the conversation, with all the meetings. We need solution. This situation cannot hold anymore. So if I, if, 
If, if I could just respond, Chair Rodriguez, I, I, I appreciate your comments. I think that over the years, uh, TLC and you, we have achieved we have achieved results for drivers. They may not always have felt like the biggest results, but we've done everything that we can, and we've often done that in partnership with you. And I can cite several examples of legislation that you introduced and that we worked with you on. Um, having said that, yes, um, this this hearing I understand this hearing is certainly not a venting session. The work does not end today by, by any stretch of the imagination. Um, we're very willing to continue the conversation. Um, I hope you know that we are always willing to work with City Council. I know we don't always agree. I know we don't agree on methods. I know that at times um, things can get a little heated. But I think, in fact, um, that when we have worked together, when the administration and the Council have worked together in this sphere, We've accomplished um, very strong results, and we've done great things for New York City. I, I agree. I just hope that everyone understands the urgency of this crisis. We cannot, you know, put ourselves in a situation to be weakness or another individual uh, taking their life away from themselves and the family. Uh, and I also recognize that the, some of the bad actors that we have in this industry, they're real, as we have bad apple everywhere, mm -hmm. including in governments, in the private, academic, all sectors. By saying that, it doesn't mean that everyone that are in the business of the medallion, they are all bad actors. And I also believe that we are, as today we are holding this hearing about, you know, bad actors that they have taken advantage of the immigrants, the dreams of immigrants. We also know that as we've been discussing how to put a cap in the past, how to address a, a, the, the, the honor that the city should give by, by allowing the yellow taxi drivers to be the only one that had the right to pick up and drop off. We also know that beside this crisis and, and the devaluation of the medallion, the fact that those drivers, they lost to be the exclusive one in Midtown, JFK and LaGuardia also is another, have played a negative impact. And we will have hold a future conversation as we have in the past. But we are committed, you know, with the co-chair, myself, the speaker, and all of us to continue playing our role that the Charter of New York City gave us as a council. And that's what I say, any rule that TLC is looking to move ahead, we just want to have a day-by-day -day conversation because as I say, I was not happy. Yes, for the mayor to make the announcement. And the day before was when I got the copy of the report that for, I will assume, for weeks, TLC already had on the cup. So with that, Council Member Levin. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, thank you very much for the testimony here. Um, I apologize if, if, uh, if the chairs have already asked this question. Um, it's the, the New York Times article that came out a couple weeks ago um, spoke about uh, some of the initial purchasers of uh, medallions sometime in the past uh, several years. Um, uh, driving up the, the, the initial auction price, um, kind of which has the, the ripple effect of, of uh, or could have had the ripple effect of, of driving the prices ever upward. Um, did TLC notice that uh, at the time? And was, was there some concern or ever any, any concern expressed? Um, at the time that um, particularly some of the larger industry players were purchasing uh, medallions at a higher price than we thought they were worth at the time? Can you just, I, let me, give me one second. There, uh, 
there was awareness and there were investigations. I was just confirming, so I have mm -hmm. my dates right. I believe yeah. it was in two, uh, 2007. Uh, there were investigations into uh, one major industry player, Gene Friedman. Mm -hmm. And those um, were and investigations carried on by, no, that was not just a TLC, I believe that was by the Department of Investigation as well. Okay, right. And I know he's facing legal action, as are other people in the, in the, in the industry. Um, so you said that, that TLC has not, does not track or has not tracked uh, subsequent sales of medallions after the initial sale from the city to uh, to the first purchase. So let me be let me be clear because I apologize if I That's wasn't it. clear. We would always track a subsequent sale. We would track any event that resulted in a transfer of ownership. Uh -huh. But what we don't track uh, is any refinancing of the asset. Okay. And, we, and it's the ref refinancing is. I see. The area. Okay. 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 Now, um, but in, but it, so you wouldn't track like the initial mortgage. So like like say for Acris, like this, the Department of Finance, right? We have it, it does track a, a refinancing, mm -hmm. right? Well, it can is it is there a, anything that prevents us from from tracking a refinancing? So we do that with mortgages here in New York City. Right? I don't uh, I don't know if there's anything that would prevent us from doing that. I don't, I don't know if there's any limitation on the level of insight we have. I mean. We, we would have to require that as a condition. So. Do we have a right, I mean, I'm, I'm just wondering, I mean, this is just a, I mean, are, are we, is there anything that prevents us from it or do we have a right to it or do we know that, do, have, we, have we wrestled with that legal question of whether we have the authority um, to, to track, to track um, uh, refinancing or any, any liens or, or, uh, or, or mortgages out on, on, a, on that asset? So we would, as I said, we would collect anything that in, involved any kind of change of ownership, even if it was just a, you know, a, a right. small change by a corporate entity. Um, I don't know the answer to the legal question of whether we are, we can collect that information. I agree with what I think is the premise of your question, mm -hmm. which is it would be extremely valuable to the city to have that information. I've you know, we have discussed, right. we have discussed it again. Uh, it's just a question, it, it, to my mind, it's a question of the extent of our, the city's jurisdiction, its ability to compel sure. refinancing but again, we, operations to provide that I mean, information. You, right, but I mean, you, with, with, or with, even with, if, even if we were, I'm sorry to interrupt, but even right. if we were to require purchasers to provide it, uh, you know, it's a question of whether we would have enough information from the lenders themselves to right. kind of gut check that information. Chair, I'm sorry, can I ask? Uh, um, okay, I mean, obviously, we, I mean, with, with Acris or, and, and subsequently to other sites that are use that available information, I mean, you can really get a, a wealth of data around mortgages to be able to see a lot of trends and retrospectively understand what has happened um, in the past and, and, and that can help uh, determine um, some actions moving forward. Uh, so in light of that, I was wondering if there's anything, are we, I mean, there's, in my mind, there are um, several ways that we need to be looking at this. First is um, uh, what to do about underwater uh, medallions now. And we can, and, and I'm, I, I'm sure that there are um, uh, different, um, different types of, of uh, distressed uh, medallions. Like, so, so I, I'm, or, or degrees, or you know, ways in which they're distressed, or uh, how they're they're over leveraged, uh, whether they were purchased uh, at too high a value to begin with, whether they are, were. Um, Further leverage through um, through additional mortgages or refinancing. Um, so I think to, that that is I think that that is something that is we I agree with the chairs that we need to be um, examining how what to do about that. And I would posit that since the city is inextricably linked to this asset because we originated. The asset we control, the the, the supply of it, um, it is inherently 
valuable because of its relationship to the city of, of New York and its and, and, and TLC, um, that we have this responsibility um, to that we have a responsibility to figure out a way to deal with how how these are distressed. So I would just posit that as a kind of a starting point. We have to do something because we have a responsibility. We're a party to this. We originated these, these medallions. And we kind of knew maybe at the time that things were a little askew or a lot askew, or we should have known. I will say that I was a council member. I took office in 2010 with, with Council Member Rodriguez, and or he took office a little bit before. I remember the budgets when we talked about, and these were, these were tough times because we were looking at cuts in New York City. Correct. Uh, we were uh, down revenue. There was, it was after the financial crisis. We were losing, we were, we were making cuts across the board. And the $30 million or so on any fiscal year that was coming in through medallion sales was, was and we, I mean, there's a collective responsibility. I take responsibility as a council member, and I think that we all have a responsibility because we all looked at that as a source of revenue. And that was something that was part of our budget conversation. I mean, when we were getting, when we, when I, I mean, I can't, uh, I, I can't quote chapter and verse, but I recall sitting in rooms either with an OMB director or Mayor Bloomberg himself talking about a budget and taxi medallion sales was part of the conversation as, as, a, as a revenue source. So again, collective responsibility there. Um, have we looked at how we are, how, how we can restructure, work with the lending industry that, ha that has either originated these loans or now holds these mortgages to, to write down the principles of underwater mortgages on these medallions? How, how do we do that? What's the process? Have we looked at, have we looked at uh, what, what's been done through the fin at, during the financial crisis, the HARP program or what have you? Um, to, to figure out mechanisms by which the city um, can work with, with, with the lenders. Because frankly, I think that they would probably want to have a mortgage that, that the medallion owner is able to pay and to, to, to stabilize the asset, even if it means taking a loss on the principal or writing down that principal. Is there, I mean, how do we do that? I think that that is, ultimately, I think that that's how we're able to, to deal with this historic, the historical problem that we have here of what's, of, 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 of these underwater mortgages and people that are just over leveraged and working 80 hours a week just to keep up on the interest of these loans. I don't know, what's, what's I'm assuming we're looking at that that's got to be something, and then it's going to require probably working with our state partners, potentially on 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 uh, regulatory or uh, legislative changes. Sorry, it's a little long-winded. I don't know what the question is exactly, but how? What's what are we looking at there? Yeah, I think that is the question, and and yes, I agree with you that that work needs to be done. Some of that work has been done. Some of that has been done through advocacy groups that have gone and, and gone in and presented hardship petitions and have advocated on behalf of owners to try to get the principles reduced, to try to get the monthly payments reduced, to try to get off of this concept of an interest-only loan, which, as you know, goes nowhere. Um, that is, the, the loan never goes away if you're just paying the interest. Um, so that work has been done. There, there, we have had meetings with lenders. We have had meetings with the NCUA a while ago. We um, are we hear, and I have heard from owners, and I have, and we have heard from some of the lending institutions that they have um, certainly they have taken it off their books. They have mm -hmm. taken the value off of their books. Yeah. So they've in their minds. Many of them have realized they're not going to collect on that. Yeah. The question is, having done that, have they communicated that to the owners? I'm hearing often the answer is no. Or have they actually changed the actual loan terms to reflect that what is now the reality, which is that the loan that might have been at 
at a very high number has been written down to a lower number. Mm -hmm. um, and so what the follow-up on that has to be is you have to then right-size the monthly payments yeah. and extend out the lifetime of the loan and yeah. hopefully get it off of a balloon loan where it's Absolutely. up every right. three years, which that's is the biggest, the, the right. balloon that's loan is the biggest problem. Yep, yep. And that's, and that's where I think that there are reforms that we could probably look to things that happened that uh, whatever Dodd-Frank or, or whatever was done after the financial crisis to, to, to reform lending practices and that's, but I think that that's, so that's definitely stuff that we can actually And work we've committed, through. you know, and we've committed to, with the driver assistance centers, yeah. we've committed to hiring, you know, directly or through an advocacy group, hiring a team of credit advocates to work with owners and to go to the banks and the lenders and to help them yeah. right-size these loans. I think a couple of things that the mayor's, the mayor's office can do, the mayor's office of operations I think could play a very uh, productive role in in doing some data crunching to, as a whole, look at what the what would be a um, a monthly payment that a driver owner could make, and therefore what is what is the right size of a loan? Now, obviously, some of these loans are as I said, you know, some of them are overextended in different ways and to different degrees. Mm -hmm. But, but like, I think that the mayor's office and TLC, and mayor's office operations, can probably help to, to, to create it, to look at the data, understand the data a little bit better, to understand what the long term. Now that now that there's a uh, the FHV cap is mm -hmm. is in place, and we get a better sense of uh, hopefully this the the overall. Um, uh, the overall system of for hire vehicles in New York City is stabilized to the extent that we can maybe have a better sense of where things are going to be in three, five, seven, ten years, so that we can understand what a what a what a driver owner can pay can pay off and how and how these loans can make sense. But I think that that could be something that the the city could um, be very helpful with in kind of then establishing and working with the lenders on a, in a large scale, either individually or you know collectively. Um, with distressed um, uh, 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 medallion owners to um, to figure out what a a right size loan looks like um, in terms of the size of the principal. Um, I, and I just want to acknowledge from the work that I know that NITWA has done and that Beta V Desai testified to earlier today. They have they have been doing. They are the organization that has been doing. Mm -hmm. um, clinics, finding out this information, approaching the lenders, and I know that they've helped deliver positive results mm -hmm. for some owners, and I know that also, as I'm sure she will be happy to tell you, they have thought a lot about what those monthly payment amounts should be. Okay. Um, but I agree with and you that that, could, that that type of conversation would benefit from data analysis as well. Um, and then the last question is, have we looked at the concept of the, because because if, if the city's going to buy out distressed mortgages, that gets really expensive really quickly. And there's probably more distressed mortgages on medallions than we can afford to buy in any given time frame. So have we looked at potentially putting the city's collateral to guarantee a refinanced loan that is right-sized? I mean, that's a, it's a concept, I think, that has legal implications and state law and state constitution. but as a concept, as a, in, as a way to provide a ba the backstop, mm -hmm. something of, of that is consequential, um, while at the same time not just wholesale buy buying out more, uh, mortgages or medallions that, are, that w we wouldn't be able to afford to do for as big a, a, a larger number as, as I think is necessary, but still has the city on the hook in some sense, but hopefully not ever having to pay because if it's a right-sized mortgage, they won't go into default. The city doesn't have to uh, come forward with uh, that guarantee. Well, this is one of, I was asked earlier by uh, Chair Rodriguez if I was aware of other jurisdictions that have attempted some form of financial assistance, and, and that is very similar to what I believe San Francisco did with its medallion market. Mm -hmm. I think it was not 
I'm, I'm afraid I don't think it was designed properly, and the result is that there's one credit union that held all the loans that thought the city had put up collateral or had guaranteed a certain amount that is now suing the city. Um, so I'm okay. sure there are lessons to be learned from that example. Sure. Okay. But I, it's a concept that I've been interested in for mm -hmm. a while as a way to try to stabilize everything um, in a way that's, that could, we could do it at a, a large enough scale instead of just putting cash out to mm -hmm. purchase, to purchase medallions. So thank you. I, I appreciate all these answers. I'm, we're gonna, there's a lot to be done here. I, agree. Um, I, I, I know you do and I hope you do uh, understand the level of um, desperation that people have because um, you know, their hopes and dreams are, have, were poured into and all of their savings and everything else that they have was poured into something of value that the city had a role in um, and then the bucket, the bottom of the bucket fell out. And we have a collective responsibility to get these owners on their feet in a way that is sustainable so that they can um, support their families, send their kids to college, uh, all the things that make up the American dream. So. I, do, I do understand it, and I can assure you that, again, as I said, everyone at TLC, we interact with drivers and owners on a regular basis, many daily. We're very aware of the pain and the problem and the crisis. We take it very seriously, and we work, we're, we work as hard as we can to do what we can I think we've made great progress. There's obviously much more work that can be done. Thanks. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Chairs. Uh, Commissioner, I, uh, I want to go back to the February 2014 auction, which resulted mm -hmm. in 40% of the participants experiencing bankruptcy. Mm -hmm. uh, the decision to conduct an auction, the decision to set the upset price, is that a decision that TLC makes on its own or in consultation who makes that decision? Who are all the players in that decision-making process? I haven't uh, worked there when there's been an auction, so I have, would have to imagine that that's made in consultation with, um, you know, that, that that would be made in consultation with other offices. I'd, I'd be surprised. Does OMB play a role? OMB is the institution responsible for the budget, so I would be, I would be surprised if they didn't. Okay. Who was the head of OMB at the time of the February 2014 auction? I don't know. That was a period I didn't work for the city. I don't, I don't remember. Okay. It was does your assistant, does the general counsel know the answer to that question? I mean, I can look it up. Yeah, I, I can look it up. I don't know offhand. You I'm have not, no idea I, who was? I, 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 you, you want me to give you a you guess? He was, he's the first deputy mayor. Okay. So I'll answer the question for you. Thank you. Can we pull up the NACUA exhibits? The quote. So as Nakua points out, a medallion has essentially two values. Right? There's the value based on the market, which can be the product of speculation, and then there's the value based on the actual ability of the medallion to generate net operating income. Right? And there's something of a paradox here. It's possible for a medallion owner to have a million dollar asset on paper but virtually no net operating income in the real world. A higher medallion value likely meant higher loan payments, which in turn likely meant less income for the driver. TLC knew or should have known the terms of each loan. TLC knew the operating expenses of running a taxi. And so from the loan terms and the operating expenses, TLC should have been able to project the level at which a medallion would no longer generate a sufficient net operating income, a net operating income that you can live on. Did TLC even attempt to make those projections during the bubble? I'm not aware. Again, I wasn't, I wasn't there during that time. I know that's an unsatisfactory, that may be an unsatisfactory response, yeah. but I, I, was, I don't know what deliberations went into the auctions. I know that the auctions were set in 20, as I said, they were set in 2013. I know that. So I'll, I'll ask it. Social yeah. policy. I'll ask it normatively. Increase the number of wheelchair accessible. Sh sh medallions. Should TLC project the point at which the medallion values are so high, the monthly loan payments are so prohibitive that it leaves a driver with virtually no or minimal 
net operating income. Is that the sort of projection that TLC should make before approving a medallion transaction as part of your statutory responsibility for financial stability? Which again, as I said, is the subject of litigation right now, what, what, the, what that exact response It's also the, the subject is. of your rules, financial stability, but, and it's but the is that the of kind of projection? That's why it's the subject of litigation. Is that the kind of projection that TLC should make before approving a transaction? That traditionally, as you know, what we have looked at is whether the purchaser, whether the potential purchaser could provide uh, documentation of sufficient funding to, uh, to enter into the loan. So that would have been a commitment letter. We didn't receive the loan application papers. We're not, we were not in the role of loan examiners or credit examiners. But you had the authority to request the loan. You had the authority to examine the loan terms as a condition for granting the medallion or the license. And from the loan terms and from the operating expenses, you could have determined whether the driver would have been able to generate a living income. That's, I, I wanna go to the Roth report. Can we go to page two of the Roth report? Not that, no. The individual owner operator section. Exhibit 30. So according to Mr. Roth's analysis, a TLC employee, uh, a driver can generate $100,000 in fares and tips every year in revenue. Uh, if you have a loan with a four point, let's just say half a million dollar mortgage with a 4.5% interest rate over 15 years, that costs about $51,000 every year plus $40,000 in operating expenses. That's $91,000 in total operating expenses, leaving the driver with $9,000 in net operating income. Right? Those were the kind of transactions that TLC approved. Do you think $9,000 is a living income? Again, I'm, I'm not familiar with the analysis that was done here. This, I know the New York Times has called this. No, we'll, 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 a, we'll provide a, you with more analyses, but, a, but do you think $9,000 is a document a living? that was produced by no, I, an employee? I'm, I, I get it. So no one, no one in TLC used. has ever seen the, the Roth report. You've made that clear. But um, is $9,000 a living income? No, of course not. Of course not. Okay. Do you think TLC should be approving transactions that leave a driver with $9,000 in net operating income? I, the TL, as I said, this is not information that TLC had in front of it when it approved transactions. Yeah. But you had the we ability to request that information as a condition for receiving the medallion. I... Yes, Perhaps we did. we did, yeah. I don't know is a point of law, you, but you, probably you certainly did. did. Can we go to the, what's, what exhibit is this? Exhibit 2122. So in addition to the Roth report, mm -hmm. TLC did its own cost and revenue analysis mm -hmm. in 2004. So the presentation contains a cost and revenue analysis for owner drivers assuming a net income for drivers of $50,000 a year the annual cost of the loan is 18,000 a year. The gross revenue, about 90,000. The operating expenses, 41,000. The net income, 49,000. Can we go to the next page? So using the same assumptions in the 2004 analysis, the same assumptions about loan terms and operating expenses, TLC could have projected the impact of higher medallion loan amounts on that operating income, right? If, if, if a loan amount at $250,000 leaves a driver with, with $49,000 in net annual income, mm -hmm. a loan amount at a million dollars would leave a driver with a net operating loss of over $4,000. Do you think, and I know you said you were not there at the time, this is a TLC analysis. 
Do you think it's responsible for TLC to approve transactions with loan amounts that leave drivers with a net operating loss of $4,000? Is that sort of thing responsible as a policy matter in the abstract? You show me the advertising and sales pitches yeah. from, from prior years, and I think I've, I have tried to make clear, and I think I've, I've made clear that obviously TLC is not in the business right now of being involved in medallion auctions. Um, the type of language that was used and the techniques that were used were not something that I personally would have done. In terms of um, whether, we, whether TLC could have created this calculator, I, I, yes, I think TLC could have created that calculator. Is that something that TLC is going to do going forward? Are you going to determine the net operating income that a driver earns before approving a medallion? I think that we have, uh, we have changes in place that we've announced. There's changes that are a part of the legislation that you and your colleagues have introduced. And I think you know we're not, I guess, talking about that legislation today. But I would hope that we can have a conversation about what types of things we could increase. When you put it that way, it sounds like a good thing to include. Can we go to Exhibit 20? So in, in addition to regulating the financial stability of the medallion market writ large, TLC had an obligation to regulate the financial stability at the level of individual licensees. And I call your attention to Exhibit 20, which I call the in incredibly shrinking financial disclosure. Uh, TLC went from demanding 21 pages of financial disclosure in the 1990s to four pages of financial disclosure in the 2000s to zero pages of financial disclosure in the 2010s. Uh, why, why did TLC over time demand less and less financial disclosure from its licensees? I, again, this is not something I've seen uh, before, so I understand your question. I don't know. I don't know where this. I don't know how you're coming up with this calculation. Sure. So, well, I'll, I'll ask. I'll, I'll ask sure a more general question. Accurate. Did TLC request less financial information and disclosure over time? I'm gonna. I don't know the answer for that. You don't know the answer, though. Okay. Uh, do you review the financial files of your licensees? Do I personally? Your agency. You, you're, you're here as a representative of TLC, not you personally. Okay. Um, so my understanding is that what's, what's reviewed is we receive uh, different parts of information about our licensees, including criminal background checks, including other uh, personal information. And as I said, for a medallion, we require a, something in the form of a commitment letter from a lender demonstrating uh, that there is, in fact, a loan that would secure the purchase of the asset. Okay. Is there additional? And who, who is responsible for reviewing those documents in your agency? Which staffers, which unit? Uh, we have a team of people who, who work on it. And are these people lawyers? What, what's their position? I can, uh, I mean, I can provide you with that information if you, if you don't, I, if you don't have if you don't have that information, I can provide you with it. I don't know. I don't know. Do you know who leads the unit that's responsible for reviewing the financial files? I think I do, but I'm not sure, so I'd rather not speculate. I'd rather not say someone's I, I, name out loud in a hearing like this if, I, if I'm not sure, but I'll commit to providing you that information. Okay. Um, do you know if those... Okay. We'll, 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 I'll ask for more information. I want to ask about... Um, because we've spoken about financial stability, we've spoken about advertising, we've spoken about the auctions. I, I want to ask you about the bad actors in the industry. Uh, when, when did the city revoke the license of Gene Friedman? We directed him to divest his medallions when he pled guilty to a federal crime. And so when was that? Sometime last year. Last year, okay. So it was a recent... But, the, but TLC's known for a long time that Gene Friedman was a bad actor in the industry. He was one of the subjects of a DOI report in 2007. He, 
He was the subject of the Roth Report in 2010. In 2012 and in 2015, he boasted about manipulating the market and engaging in speculation. DOI said that he was one of the driving forces behind collusion in the market. Uh, in 2013, he had a settlement with the AG for overcharging drivers of taxi cabs. Uh, he was later found to have evaded taxes. Uh, why did it take, all these complaints about him, all these findings about him date as far back as 2007, the DOI report, if not before then, why did it take so long to revoke his license? I know that there was extensive litigation with Mr. Friedman, and that may have had an impact. Why would that prevent you from, I, I mean, TLC has the authority to revoke a license based on good moral character. You have the authority to revoke a license based on fitness to hold a, a license. Mm -hmm. uh, if, if, if I'm, I'll just frame it in the abstract. If, if I'm a bad actor in the industry who's stealing wages from my workers, who's engaging in collusion and manipulating the market, who's evading taxes, do you think that I am fit to hold a license within the meaning of TLC's rules? In the abstract, I don't want that person, or you if you are that person, to hold a TLC license. So you but would, vo you would the, revoke my license? I, revocation is serious, and you look at yeah. several and so, factors. So it's wage right? theft? So you're talking about in the, So is overcharging about, drivers? That's pretty serious. Collusion in, in the, the market abstract. is pretty serious. You know, if, if one of these individual drivers make a mistake, TLC will aggressively crack down on them. But when corporate owners like Gene Friedman are admittedly are admitting to speculating in the market. There seems to be no accountability. There's, there's enforcement against the underdog, but not enforcement against speculators like Michael Cohen or Gene Friedman. So again, is that, if I engaged in wage theft, if I engaged in collusion, would you revoke my license? When these people were convicted of crimes of those that of of those crimes, their licenses were revoked. So your opinion. So your opinion. My that, opinion so, is so that a DOI there's a, 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 a DOI finding. These are entitled to process. No, I understand. Well, there's this criminal process and then there's administrative process. So if there's a DOI finding of collusion, that in your mind is not sufficient grounds for revocation. That's not what I said. I'm, I'm asking not, you that question. I'm not question. aware. Uh, sorry. You said that conviction is grounds for revocation, right? What about conviction a DOI would be finding of collusion? For revocation. I don't know that there. I'm sorry, I'm just not familiar with the DOI. I know that there was a DOI. What about the settlement with the Attorney General's office in 2013? I'm not sure what. I'm not sure if that settlement resulted in a conviction, but yeah, it didn't result in a conviction, and it did result in restitution. I want to. Just want to walk through. Can we go to Exhibit Nine? So I, so I think Commissioner, you and I have a disagreement. I am. It's my position that TLC had a central role in creating the speculative bubble that led to the mass forced closures and bankruptcies. The TLC was in a position to prevent the bubble and in many ways helped create the bubble. And so, and so there were several warning signs that were ignored by TLC. Uh, in 1987, then, TLC Commissioner Gerben, Gorman Gilbert said the following to the New York Times, what we've created here is the currency in the medallion themselves. We've diverted the attention of the industry from serving the public to being concerned about the value of that commodity. So there was awareness, TLC awareness, of speculation in the medallion market dating as far back as 1987. Uh, exhibit 10, the second warning. In 1990, TLC, in partnership with several city agencies, began to investigate, quote, complaints that taxi medallion brokers and lenders were selling the medallions at prices far above the prevailing market rate to unsuspecting buyers. 
quote, in one case cited by the commission, a buyer paid $138,000 for a medallion in August, while the market price was about $125,000. So in 1990, a $13,000 price differential was enough to spark an investigation from TLC. I thought, as, as I said, the mayor ordered a 45-day review into the role of brokers. Sure. We've, we've, we've started well, l l Long after the we've collapse also agreed of the medallion market. We've set up the office, gonna... the business yeah. practices accountability yeah. unit. We've agreed to set up uh, several offices to look internally at what TLC does and is doing and how we can strengthen our processes. And we've agreed to set up services, some of them as a result of legislation from city council, to, to um, offer more assistance, including financial credit counseling to the sure. drivers and to the yes. owners. Se several so years after the collapse of the medallion market. But 1990 demonstrates. I think we're here to talk sure. about what we can do going forward. We're that actually here to learn from history and explore the origins of the crisis and talk about how we go forward. Uh, exhibit 13. As you know, as I referenced earlier, there was a DOI report finding collusion and speculation in the medallion market. Which is not a criminal conviction, which is referred, which was then, there was a criminal referral then that was made, is my understanding. Sure. But DOI in, warned TLC of collusion and manipulation in the medallion market. Uh, exhibit 14. In 2010, former Commissioner Matthew Douse, speaking before the International Association of Transportation Regulators cited the willingness of banks to offer loans without a down payment, not as cause for concern, but as cause for celebration and cheerleading. Quote, we raised over $200 million for the city of New York, and some of these folks are offering 0% down. You tell me what bank walks around asking for a 0% down on a loan. It's just really amazing, and it's a testament to the strength of the medallion Exhibit 15, of course, is the Roth report. Exhibit 16, both in That's 2012 and in 2015. An That's let me, let me reference in the New York Times. I'm sorry? Sure. Well, 2010, the Roth report came out. In 2012 and in 2015, Gene Friedman was publicly boasting about rigging the medallion market. Quote, I'd go to an auction, I'd run up the price of a medallion, then I'd run to my bankers and say, look how high the medallions are priced. Let me borrow against my portfolio. And they let me do that. Exhibit 18, when asked about Mr. Friedman's public boasting about speculation, Mr. Dow said, well, we were aware that they were bidding up the prices. Yes, I mean, the goal was to try to get the highest price. So not only was TLC aware of speculation by the likes of Gene Friedman? But according to Mr. Dallas, your predecessor, he saw speculation as a good thing, as the goal of the agency, as a metric of success. And then, of course, Exhibit 19 is the public letter from NACUR, the, national, the federal regulator, warning about speculation in the medallion market. So there was warning after warning after warning about the risk or the reality of speculation in the medallion market. And I'll, I'll end with this point. It, it seems to me TLC failed to regulate the financial stability of the medallion market. Your agency failed to enforce the law against bad actors like Gene Friedman, who was engaged in collusion, tax evasion, and wage theft. Your agency failed to heed all these warnings, both from within the agency and beyond, about market manipulation. Your agency knowingly sold medallions to unsuspecting buyers at inflated values. Your agency engaged in false advertising to immigrants, selling them a false promise of the American dream. Your agency approved transactions with predatory loans that cannibalized the incomes of drivers. So I want to return to one of my very first questions. Given these facts, given this hearing, are you finally willing to come to grips with TLC's culpability for the medallion crisis and the human cost that it has inflicted on, on drivers? Are you, feel, are you willing to acknowledge some level of moral responsibility I'm, on the part of your agency and on the part of the city of New York? I'm absolutely willing to acknowledge the pain that people are suffering. I'm sorry. Are you responsible for that suffering. pain in any way? I, I, I've described TLC's role in this. I haven't said that TLC doesn't have a role in this. I have not process. heard an acknowledgement what I have of responsibility. Said, what I have said is 
the responsibility for regulating this industry goes far beyond TLC. It goes to City Council, it goes to the Department of Financial Services, and it goes to the federal government. Who, who decides whether someone receives a medallion? Is it the City Council or is it you as a commissioner? Of we, 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 uh, we approve the transfer yeah. of a medallion. So, so we pass yeah. the laws and, and you implement the laws. And what I have said yeah. many times today and what I will continue to say is if you look at the steps that this administration yeah. has taken to provide relief to drivers in this market and to cap the number of four hire vehicle licenses, to spread the responsibilities of providing services so they don't just fall on yellow, I think you will see that this administration has done a tremendous amount for the yellow industry. And I think that work obviously continues. We've just recently announced, as I said, we're waiving um, collection of medallion fees. We're working with you to make that a permanent uh, to make that permanent under Councilman Levine's legislation. We've expressed, uh, again, we haven't talked about the testimony today. If you've seen my written testimony, we've expressed uh, willingness to work with you, which I mean on additional steps that we can take to help. But, but admission is people. the first step toward recovery. And it, and it seems, you know, throughout the hearing, it, there, there are people who are suffering. There are people who might die working who will never have a retirement because they have been reduced to the status of indentured servants who have seen all of their income cannibalized by predatory loans, right? And so the tone of self-congratulation uh, is out of touch with the plight I don't think of the drivers of and the reality of the medallion collapse. From this side, but if you want me to, I absolutely accept responsibility for anything I did that contributed to this crisis or that deepened this crisis, absolutely. There's no, there's no question I would accept that. And are you, are you willing to apologize to the drivers here? I, yes, I, yes, I'm apologize sorry. Apologize Are you willing to apologize to the drivers? I'm, as I said. They're right here, you can apologize to them. Mr. Chair, I think you're turning this into something different from what it should be. I was turning to them to talk to them but I don't need to be told to you what to do or when to do it. If you, you're, okay. you're under no obligation to apologize. Are you willing to apologize to them? I've answered this question several times and each time you've sure. cut me off. So I've said okay. yes, I am, uh, no, no, no. I've said yes. I right. accept responsibility for right. what TLC has done, to, for what I have done to um, make this crisis worse. I have tried to explain today my belief and I know you don't want to hear it, but that other people are also responsible, that the main cause of this is the lending practices of the banks and the credit unions, as you have detailed. Yes. Commissioner, I thank you for your time. Thank you, Chair. Commissioner, this is what I, you know, someone wrote something that Twitter I feel that express also how we feel. Mm -hmm. That person said, if corporations were dealt such a blow, they would have been compensated immediately. Here the suffering is ignored. This is a moral outrage. We need to fix it now. You heard from the drivers and, and those are having advocated for the right, independent medallions owner, that one of the reasons why we as a city, because this is not just only about TLC, involve many, even though the agency is the one responsible, leading, you know, the supervision of those that we believe were, had been back actors, but also the lack of leadership also that we have seen in TLC for now, and again, I'm not thinking about, yes, you, as the current leaders at TSC, is the agency, per se, previous uh, 
it could be current individuals are still being involved, you know, to fail to make individuals accountable, those uh, that, as I said, were those bad actors. So I, I believe, I hope, that as the mayor is going nationwide, that he is stepping in help us at this moment. I think that what we learned from the real estate crisis was that the small one was the one affected. Banks will pay back. What we know is that a lot of people took advantage of the real estate crisis, or the housing crisis. And I think that this is a, a important moment. I know that we've been trying to address this crisis, but I hope again that you, in the role that you're playing right now, City Hall, and of course, I would like to see the mayor stepping in and putting together a plan on how we will give the dignity back. This is, I love programs, I love counseling, but this is about money. This is about mortgage. This is about individual that they use, that they use the value of the medallion to send their kids to college. Those who are sitting here, that they use the value to buy the house. So this is about, I would like to see a plan. I would like to see number. I, we will work together with counseling, but this is about, are we ready to put the numbers on the table? And be able to say, as, the federal government did it to the real estate when the housing crisis, the real estate crisis. Now the city of New York should put our own plan to rescue. <laughs> and, and, and of course, as I said, today we're focusing on the value of the medallions. But this is about Uber and Lyft, too. This is about... <laughs> This is also about enforcement. This is about where are we displaying the TLC officer to do enforce. I would say 100% of them, they should be, yes, here in Midtown, JFK, and, and LaGuardia. I think that this, I believe that even, at the mo even in the middle of the crisis where we are today, if we as a city will be honoring the exclusive rights or yellow taxi being the one that, the only one that do pick up and drop out in the Milton area, in the JFK and the That situation, we will be having this situation different. Going after the bad actors, but at the same time knowing that the driver, they will be able to make the living as they work 60 hours a week to support themselves. So, I hope again that we will continue working together, but this is a moment to, you know, step in and understand that this, we cannot come back, you know, here in two months from now, and yes, putting a Band-Aid. You know, this is not a crisis that will be cured with a Band-Aid. This requires... <laughs> and, 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 and my last thing is, I hope that no one, first of all, if, if there's anyone at TLC that plays some role that turned the back to this situation, I hope that those people will step out. I hope that anyone that has, has some level of responsibility will not come back to the agency in any role, if by any chance they were weakness, they decided not to make those brokers accountable. And I just hope again that this is gonna be a moment where those of you guys that, you know, been doing your job, you know, having the interests of the drivers and the individual owners at the top priority, 
you know, 100% to continue working together. But if there's anyone still in the agency that plays a role today, or if they have played a role in the past, I hope that none of those individuals will come back to play a role or any leadership level at TLC. This is a big crisis that we are facing. We need solution, but anyone that has been involved, associated with this, should step out immediately. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. Share with this by one of the medallion owners, Bernardo Celerino, which is something mm -hmm. I can share with you. Please. That I say you owe three hundred fifty-six dollars it, it, of additional taxi cap and held vehicle tax interest and penalty, and then say information received from the New York City Tax and Limousine Commission indicate you have additional uh, taxable trips then close the schedule reflect the details of the proposed order adjustment. Is this something that a... I'll certainly look into it if you can provide it to me, if you can give me that or we can try to make a copy here today. Okay, okay, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Chair Rodriguez. Chair Torres, so thank you. That, uh, now we go to the next panel. Jana Shaw. And we put in the clock in, sorry. Can we quickly? Yeah. Okay. Sorry, Commissioner. Sorry, I have a, a statement from one of the sponsors of, of our legislation, a legislative package, Council Member Adrian Adams. She, she writes, it reads, Dear Chair Torres and Rodriguez, thank you for this important hearing today. I represent District 28 in Southeastern Queens, a working and middle class community where a substantial number of taxi drivers reside. For many drivers in my district, medallions were the ticket to the American dream. When the taxi medallion burst in 2014, my constituents were left with the short end of the stick. They worked hard to scrape together every penny and took on loans to purchase a million dollar asset they believed would bring them some financial stability. Instead, they were duped into partaking in predatory loans. There was a lack of financial transparency in the taxi industry and my bill Intro 1584 seeks to change that by requiring all medallion buyers to submit an annual financial statement to prevent hardworking drivers from being preyed upon and taken advantage of. Some may argue that revenue for medallions was projected to increase as the years went on, but even if the revenues were to steadily increase, it still wouldn't justify a million dollar price tag and would not be enough for drivers to pay off their loans with such predatory terms. The crash eventually led to more than 950 medallion owners to file for bankruptcy. It's fairly easy to see parallels between the medallion bubble and the real estate mortgage bubble. Prices of these assets were bound to crash and the bubble was bound to pop. There are many entities that bear responsibility. Lenders kept on giving out money with very little regard to the borrower's ability to pay back. TLC was not effectively monitoring or regulating the medallion sales. And leaders within the taxi industry were pushing an asset which was clearly overvalued. We must do better by hardworking New York City taxi drivers. Intro 1584 will certainly help to do just that. Respectfully submitted, Councilmember Adrian Adams. Thank you, Chair. So we're going to be continue calling Nicola Hent, Elizabeth Hent, Alice Brown, Bernardo Celerino, Tamar, Tamara Bisniakova, Jana Stroll. We put in the clock in two minutes, please, because of the numbers of other... How many minutes? Two minutes. So what I'm saying is that we are now passing the two minutes. Please, if you, if you take more than that, summarize. <clears throat> two minutes. Anyone can begin, so we can start there in the left, and then we keep going to the right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman Rodriguez. Thank you, Mr. Councilman Torres. I really appreciate you for what you did today and probably you'll do in the future. But I, uh, I will say, please be careful. I don't want to happen to, to you what happened to Mr. R uh, Ruben Diaz. Uh, your colleagues, Speaker of the uh, City Council, Mayor, 
Como will be ready to eliminate you. Uh, I should start with this. Thanks to the New York Times for one year long investigation and cost them a lot of money. Personally, I shot for the movie at least three times with them. I took them to JFK to expose the robbery, what has been done to us. One year investigation was not cheap. Now, I have here a papers from Cranes from 2015. It says here, Cuomo jumps into Uber debate, urge council to delay vote and ma on mayor's plan. Is anybody here from the state? No. They have a big criminal hands in this robbery, what has been done to us. Further down, we have a chance to correct this, but it's not going to be easy. You saw me in uh, uh, 1990, the medallion with the exclusive rights to hail in New York City. The law was in the book 52-0484. You took my exclusive rights and gave it to others for free, not only robbing me, but robbing the city of the income revenue. They don't care about the city, they care about their pocket. Uh, I'm Elisabetta Hent, and I wanted to give my time to Nikolai Hent. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. Where do you go from here? You or either give me my exclusive rights back, and I'll continue to work and do the job what I did for, uh, for more than 21 years, or if you want to buy my exclusive rights back as a city, you can do that but not a penny low the 945,000 what was the last sailing of the medallion in 2000 auction, 2014 auction. Yeah. Not a penny less, only up. If you want to do something soon and early, you can do it tomorrow. In La Guardia and JFK, especially terminal, uh, uh, the JetBlue, Terminal 5. It's true, La Guardia has construction, but not only, only for yellow, not for Uber and Lyft. We used to have seven places where we pick up in La Guardia. All those places are out from us and in our Uber and Lyft. Who controls the Port Authority, the La Guardia Airport? Governor Como, Evil Eyes Como. Tomorrow, you can do that if you want it, because it's a city land, not a commerce land. And, te and JFK Terminal 5, why we are out one mile from the terminal and in our Uber, Lyft, and all the hustlers do what Terminal 7 did, Terminal 1, Terminal 8, Terminal 4. Uh, other problems, what we have, I don't know how much I'm going to work one, two more, three years. But thanks God I'm still able to work. But uh, uh, whatever plan will do to co correct this, it has to be with my retirement too. Not, not, I'm not going to give up. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, council members. I, know underst I understand we have only two minutes. It used to be three. TLC, council Torres. TLC do not have the guts to admit their culpability. We demand a mea culpa from TLC even in the next meeting, okay? I also want to say that uh, we also request council members or somebody, some authority to contact NCUA, National Credit Unions Administration, because I personally did. I went to civil court and I lost my case because the judge in civil court found that to go up from 4% interest rate to six and a quarter interest rate is not overcharged. But I'm positive sure if I charge that judge $62.50 for a $40 ride, TLC is gonna send me a ticket for overcharge, okay? So basically, I want to say that um, I have contacted also NCUA and Midland Fund Services 
They are responsible for more than 3,000 loans from former Melrose Credit Union. Mel uh, Midland is blaming NCUA. NCUA is blaming Midland, Midland, so there's no way to appeal any case. The time is expired already. The yellow cap industry do not ask for welfare help. We don't need welfare, we need your help. And your help means to investigate as much as you guys can to find out what can we do. And if eventually we can be compensated for all these damages, I'm 63 already. I'm also close to retire. I'm expecting to have my, my own 401k. I'm not gonna have it. In fact, it's very difficult even to find drivers today because there are no more drivers. And I just learned about the new fashion for Uber and Apple and Lyft owners that they are leasing half of the shift. So they are allowed to rent, to get money from, uh, to get our passengers, okay, or our ex-passengers in their own benefit. And the TLC is overlooking to that, and Uber and Lyft also don't do any, doesn't do anything. Maybe you can do something, guys. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Um, we come here today together to look for uh, justice. And I thank you, Mr. Rodriguez, Mr. Torres. I'm impressed with all the expression what you approach to Tax Limousine Commission. Um, the commissioner was not prepared. He didn't do his homework. He came very unprepared for everything what we present tonight, to, today here. Um, I'm a owner of a yellow cab. I bought the, the it was a transfer in 2012. So in this time, um, the commissioner says he's, he doesn't have clue about, uh, uh, he's not involved about when they do the transfer. When you do the transfer, TLC is charging you. They cost me $10,000 to do this. My husband died, so we have to do this from his 100% on to 100% to his wife. So in this case, I own, what I own? I want four tires, I'm a owner. What I own? I want nothing. I'm, four, I'm 64 years old. And um, in August, I have to change the car or do the bankruptcy. I have, I bought the, the transfer was 560,000. For seven years I pay and I'm in the same boat because uh, Meros Credit Union um, is out, Midland is playing game with us. So what we can do now, um, I'm, I'm the next thing to do suicide because in August I have, I have two choices, buy the car or do bankruptcy. So how old I am? I'm 64. I'm gonna, I'm gonna be retired in two years. So I understand all the owners who comes today together to look for, for uh, something to be done. Can this can be done today? Can we start all this today? Because the commission, tax limousine commission, they put them hands up and they said the city is everything. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, May, Miss, can you say your name, please, for record? Uh, Jenna Stroh. Okay. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I am Tamara Vishnyakova, and I'm taxi fleet owner. Um, I'm a taxi medallion owner that have been, my medallion have been com paid off completely. And however, I am still in a big problem. And some of our taxi owners are 80 plus years old and have sadly lost our life savings because we invested in the city's yellow cap franchise, which is now worth nothing. We had time when drivers, owners, and the city of New York were making money. Right now, everything is zero. My investment is zero, and uh, monthly income is 3.5 times less. Um, I want to remind you what is written on the top of our heads. A government of the people, by the people, for the people. And we are the people. We are the people that last five years were begging TLC for help. We were begging and knocking each door. We had hearings, meetings, emails, and what we got? All we got, just mental hotline. 
I am not crazy. How mental hotline on the phone can help me to bring back all my investment? I am not crazy. I am not was begging for mental hotline. So we are begging to bring our industry up. We are begging to put the cap on Uber and Lyft. We are begging to exempt taxes from 250 surcharge. How we can compete with Uber uh, when our customers sit down and see right away on the daytime 350 on the meter and at night even more. Sometimes they just leave our taxes, our poor beaten and bleeding taxi that were left on the side on the curb bleeding and by, beaten with those wolf uber cars thank, thank you miss hello my name is elise Bruhl, and to tell you a little bit about myself i worked in my taxi practically every day for 25 years, and at times I would wonder when I could take a day off. My daughter, at the time, was a little girl, and she would sit in front of, she would sit in front with me because at times I didn't have a babysitter. She would sometimes fall asleep, this little kid. But nothing stopped me from believing that one day my taxis, as I'm giving it, giving to it, it would give back to me. And so now I come to this. What happened to the taxi industry was a faux pas. What happened to the industry was not at a time of financial despair in New York City. It was at a time of great prosperity. It was when greed outweighed everything conceivable. New York City did not care about those men and women who believed desperately in the system. It only cared, and still does, about the new kid in town, Uber, and how much money it could derive from it. You, it became insatiable with greed. Uh, okay. Have you decided what you want from us and how we can survive? You must keep the cap and have a committee to unwind the damage that has been done. Don't throw away the vestiges that you already created because one day it may be too late. The next witnesses are David Byer of the Committee for Taxi Safety, Pat Russo, Daniel Ackman, Taxi Medallion Buyer, Galena, Taxi Medallion Owner, Ganesh from Elmhurst, and Suvez from Elmhurst. Uh, I apologize in advance if I'm mispronouncing anyone's name. And is Vito Lanza from the New York City Taxi Alliance. Uh, Emmanuel Soffel, uh, Carolyn Prots, okay. Good morning, Chairman, including those who are cell phoning and council member. My name is Carolyn Pratz. I'm a medallion owner, and I'll be addressing TLC's role in the debacle. 
there's a lot that hasn't been covered today. The problem has always been the excessive number of cars on the road. In 2011, there were 50,000 for hire vehicles, including taxis. There's now 135,000. And the problem continues to get worse. Even after the cap that you passed last summer, there's 6,000 more cars on the road now than there were last summer. It's not complicated math. As I've already explained to the council in the past, the crux of the problem lies with the TLC, their lack of enforcement of existing rules, a list of which is attached to my testimony. The strategy of the TLC is to express sympathy, throw us a few crumbs so that they'll have talking points, and then continue their apparent policy of dismantling the medallion system. The 2016 congestion study, according to the 4,000-page dossier that I acquired through someone who did FOIL, was much more than a study about congestion. According to the many documents and emails, it was to be a road map for the future of the entire industry. The documents are heavily redacted. The conclusions and policies remain secret. Judging by what has ensued between January 16 and now, I think we can surmise what they were and are. Chair Torres wondered if the TLC had become more of a spectator than a regulator. But it's worse than that. The facts paint an ugly picture of collusion by regulators who have become, in essence, the compliance department of a multinational corporate predator. The TLC became the enabler of the destruction of the franchise, the taxi medallion system, that was created by the city, sold at a price determined by the city, at the many auctions that were held by the city, all the while laying out the red carpet for that predator, and at the same time continually professing that it had no authority to control the situation. As previous Commissioner Zoshi said, quote, the TLC watched. They watched while they created a vast pool of slaves with no path to the middle class. If you, if you can summarize, we just have so many. The idea of an office of financial stability that should reside within the TLC makes about as much sense as inviting Shola Olataya back to New York City. You remember who I'm talking about. I know. To supervise lead remediation of NYCHA buildings. It would be far better to have an independent body, perhaps the yeah. still yet to be formed medallion task force yeah. overseeing the TLC. Thank you. I, I just want to quickly correct it. The, the legislation calls for DOI to be part of that, invest, that investigative partnership. So DOI is independent, is, has the kind of independence that you're looking for. Right, but the information will only be good as, as good as what oh. they get from TLC, yeah. and I don't believe anything that you're going to get from yeah. TLC. I'm going to keep care uh, Mr. Chairman, I appreciate it. My name is Pat Russo. I'm going to concede yeah. my time okay. to Ms. Potts. Oh, thank, thank you, you Pat. Carol. Okay. Um, under the rules that they will be considering, and by they I mean TLC in July, guided by the DOT TLC congestion study that was released last week, the excess cars and the 62% increase in greenhouse gases won't be removed from the roads. They and their emissions will be offloaded to the boroughs, including your borough, the Bronx, which is already number 62, I think, out of 62 counties in New York State in terms of health. So get ready, Bronx. Uh, instead, the continua instead of the continuation of pretend and extend policies by TLC, I would suggest a number of things. Firstly, the TLC's role in the medallion debacle should be investigated point by point. There should be a thorough house cleaning, including major personnel changes. Their mission statement, and this is the most important part that nobody has talked about, must be made crystal clear to them when you leave it to them to decide what their policies are going to be, they just leave it at consumer choice and safety, driver welfare, and accessibility. That doesn't go far enough. They're responsible for the stability of the entire industry, including the yellow taxi medallion franchise. The remediation measures that they're proposing to paper over their past negligence and malfeasance will provide them with talking points, all the while pushing more medallion on owners under the poverty line. Lastly, I'd like to point out that it is in New York City's interest to protect the franchise, the taxi medallion. You already threw away $2 billion in medallions that you can't sell. I'm sure the city budget would be in much better shape with those $2 billion, and those were for wheelchair accessible medallions. If the city were to reinstill confidence in the medallions, it would be to everyone's benefit, particularly the taxpayer. 
since we're thinking about bailouts. That, that cannot be accomplished by a TLC left to its own devices. It cannot be accomplished without the encouragement and supervision by elected officials. Thank you. Councilman um, Rodriguez, Councilman Torres, thank you for this opportunity and fellow council members. My name is Dan Ackman. And I represent, along with the law firm of Wolf Haldenstein, a class action a lawsuit, two, two class action lawsuits pending in Queens on behalf of buyers at the 2013 and 2014 auctions. A lot has been said about the auctions, but also some has been said about the TLC's response to these problems. In our case, we've been met with constant intransigence and stonewalling. We had to get a court order to get Chairman Joshi to testify, which we finally did. We had to get a court order for the TLC to produce a document drafted by OMB following these auctions about why the medallion values had crashed. And I want to focus on that aspect of it, because I think that part of it has been, has received a lot less focus on why the medallion prices went up. I think the key thing is why they went down. And I think what happened is, after the 2013, at the 20, before the 2013 and 2014 auctions, the CLC made a series of false and misleading statements, the most important of which are their omissions. They never said to the potential buyers that the CLC would soon license an effectively unlimited number of black cars affiliated with Uber and Lyft and allow them to compete directly with yellow cabs. That's what caused the medallion prices to crash. It wasn't that they, they might have been high, but they weren't too high. Because at the time, medallions were taking in as much as $170,000 a year in net revenue. And even if they were selling for a million dollars, and very few sold at that point, at that, at that amount, but even the ones that did sell at that amount, you can certainly finance that kind of loan when you have $170,000 in gross income, which is what they had at the time. The problem is the TLC let 100,000, first 10,000 extra black cars, then 20,000, then 30,000. Now, then there's 90,000 additional black cars to compare, compared to where they were in 2014. That's what caused the crash. That's what caused the problems. It's not the lenders, it's not the speculation, and it's not really the brokers either. It's what the TLC did after the fact that caused the demise of the taxi medallion. Thank you. Okay. Hi, my name is Galina Kaminker, and I am taxi owner, medallion owner. Um, honestly, I never thought I would be sitting here. That's my worst dream, but I guess it is a reality. So I'm here to um, try to save the industry, and I'm here to speak on behalf of myself, all immigrants, and all people, unfortunately, that we lost nine people that we know the lost. There are so many that we do not know that died because of health implication. So I'm here to speaking up in their behalf as well. If I say today that my family lost everything that we worked so hard for the, for the past 36 years, I'll be lying. We lost our future as well. Do I hold bank accountable for it, for what happened? Far, partial, uh, partially, not fully, but I do hold TLC and the city accountable for what happened to our industry. Um, I am, as I said, a medallion loaner with fortunately 200,000 in loan. Um, I guess I'm lucky I'm not in a million, but that does not um, say that I can make my monthly payments because what I'm currently getting from the leasing company is much less than I, what I own to the bank. Um, I'm expecting that soon enough bank will be after me. They will probably repossess my car, my medallion. Um, and that's the best scenario. The worst scenario, I will still have to hire a lawyer. I will still have to pay the money for the lawyer to go through this process, which I don't have the money, and all the humiliation. Humiliation by, I never wanted this. I never expected this. And um, uh, that's, that's all I can say. Today, I'm here to plea, beg. If I have to get on my knees, I will do. We need you to save our industry. We need you to save our industry. We need the money. We can, we're not looking for bailout. And we need the new TLC rules. We can, I'm not for Mr. Uh, Roth. He is, I understand, is a future one to be uh, nominated. 
we need the fresh blood. He was there during Joshi. She never listened to us. I, I emailed so many times. I was there. Nobody even listened to me. We need somebody who can be fresh blood. And Mr. Roth does not qualify for fresh blood, and he cannot be biased. I, By the way, you don't have to stand on your knee because we are here to. But I guess you no, know all, how all many I, times I emailed. All I'm saying is that we are here to be there for you guys. I hope so. I, I have faith. Hi, good afternoon, and thank you so much, all of you. Please give us some time and hearing from us about Medallion Bhalu Christ. My name is Ganesh Chaudhary. In the business, almost 20 years, we bought the medallion in 2006. When I bought the medallion, I have a one dream. When I paid the medallion, I have a, that is money will be come from my rest of the life for retirement life. But now, after 2014, now medallion have a big tension. If you have anybody medallion right now or not, they have a big tension because we can't afford to pay the mortgage now. By higher mortgage, we are losing for business after 2014. That is starting all our plan. Lot of owner is die, already suicided, you know everything. So we have a big problem. So we request all of you, please, please, if you have a kindness, if you have realized with us, the Medallion individual owner, so help us and give me some more guests, uh, death forgiveness, the more guests, forgiveness. I request to you, all of you, I am going to one time in the bank, and bank loan officer honestly tell me that no one is your side, no city mayor, no your governor, no your TLC, no broker. So you try to big campaign, Go to the city, talk to the them, you can get some help from them. So I'm really appreciate to you. Please help us again more on our suicide or any frustration. So request all of you, help us. Give me some forgiveness alone. Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, my name is Vita Lanzer. Uh, I'm an individual medallion owner. I've been driving a New York City taxi full-time since May 4th, 1978, over 41 years. Uh, the medallion owners had the same technology before Uber and Lyft, and the TLC said we can't use it because it's a street hail. When Uber and Lyft came in, they said it's a different business, it's pre-authorization. And then they allowed what they called gypsy taxis because they didn't have medallions that came into the city free to steal our business. They say Uber and Lyft has more lobbyists than anybody. What they should be saying is they have more bribers than anybody. And what were they lobbying for? To rob what I had to pay for my whole life? I had to work for a company for five years to save money to put a down payment on a medallion, and they wanted to rob the value of, of my labor so they can get everything for free. You know, why don't they keep the congestion price for Uber and Lyft because they didn't pay for anything and compensate the medallion owners who they robbed and take away the congestion fee from us because we had an asset that was worth over a million dollars and they destroyed that asset, 85% to 90% of it, and we shouldn't have to pay for being robbed. Let them pay for robbing us. Let them pay a congestion fee. Let them, co let them compensate us for stealing what I had to work for my whole life so they can get everything for free at the expense of my labor of, of over 41 years. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Oh, I see. I'm okay. The next panel. Nissan Ahmed Mabur Ode. Can I and I can do and I can, I can do it as a confirmation. Golan Talukter Jamfel Dorji Nini Godashi. Richard Piskey. Uh, 
Nino for bias. Yes. Okay. Oh, Nino, you here. Okay, good. Dana, Serene. Furba, Lama. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is uh, Richard Lipsky, and I'm <coughs> proud to sit here and stand with the immigrant medallion owners. Um, as everyone has pointed out, this is a city of immigrants, and never has an immigrant class been treated so disrespectfully as this class of immigrants. Um, listening to the painful testimony of the TLC acting chair, I was reminded of the old expression, the operation was a success, but the patient died. <laughs> Everything they did for medallion owners was just this much short of effective, I guess. Um, I'm also reminded of the old saying, please don't help us anymore. <laughs> the, uh, as my, my colleague uh, Carolyn Proz has mentioned, there was a, not only a willful blindness here, um, it wasn't that the TLC was an, uh, not an honest broker, they were willfully involved in the destruction of the taxi medallion. Now what's interesting, and I want to give a shout out to uh, the staff that put that report together. It is an outstanding piece of work as someone who taught for 10 years at Queens College. I would give it an A+, plus, but I'm waiting for the second volume before I'm going to grade it, because the first volume focuses, as the Time story did, on the banks, but the second volume needs to focus on the TLC's regulatory disgrace in undermining the value of the medallion. And as uh, Councillor Ackman pointed out, not only did they take the money, but while they were taking the money, they were funneling FHVs into the system, which is contrapuntal to your narrative, which is the city was only interested in the money because they were taking all this money and yet at the same time they were taking this money and needed that money, they devalued the medallion. That's what needs to be investigated. Why would a TLC in charge of regulating this environment disregard the revenue stream and allow 130,000 FHVs to come in, why the sea change from being greedy revenue enhancers to being promiscuous FHV enablers? That's a good question to investigate. Thank you, Richard. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Torres Rodriguez, thank you for what you're doing up here. I really appreciate it. My name is Nino Hervias. I've been driving a taxi since 1984 and since 1990 as a medallion owner. I thought I, I had all figured out and on the path of achieving the American dream. Right now, what I'm facing as thousands of others is the American nightmare, and not because we didn't did our, uh, work the way it should be in facing our responsibilities. We all agree that medallion owners need immediate help to mitigate our loans or buy back our medallions. You, f you have to find a way. Our present situation has brought to me and my family a dire consequences and to thousands of others medallion owners. We know about suicide, bankruptcies. Each day that goes by with no solutions is one more owner that is losing everything that they've been working for. 
solutions. Let's focus on solutions right now, immediate solution that we need. It is bailout, or whatever you call it, to remedy these to toxic lungs that we have and find out the real value of the medallion, not just anything that can be made up just to look as feel good about it. But the other imme immediate solution that is needed, and not much has been said, it is the numbers of Ubers and its imitators cars on the road. They, they are on every single street, hotels, airports, and also doing some illegal pickups by the thousands every single day. They must be cut by, by at least 50% to begin with. That, that is one of the major problems why no one <coughs> makes ends meet. My retirement, I already forgot about it. It has been wiped out. So we need your help as soon as possible, please. My name is Purva Sherpa. I'm from Nepal. So I'm here, I'm talking about personal things. Uh, I come here in 2004 <coughs> as an immigrant, and uh, I work like uh, seven years uh, without my kids and wife. And I make money from the <coughs> grocery store and consultant. And <coughs> the money I spend for the um, for the all money for the down payment, like $60,000. And I brought the medal in 675000 And still I have loan for 530000 loan from the Signature Bank. Signature Bank. And um, then 2011, I brought this medal in. And uh, so since then, two, two years later, 2013, it's every day is crash. And I'm diving, like I've been diving like seven days for eight years. It's, they can track in my license. TLC will know that. <clears throat> now I have problem my lower back pain because I sit too much in patients. And uh, so <clears throat> I can work now. And my partner, I have uh, my partner. My partner passed away because he's got um, too much pressures because all this trafficking, traffic and all this um, torture of this bank loans and uh, this paying loan. And he said, it's every day, oh, what can I do? I, we have to bankrupt this, this. I said, we have to wait. This is America, somebody's look at us. That's why I tell him, but, but he passed away on <clears throat> September 25th, 2018. And he drive whole day, and he come back, and he got a heart attack. And now his problem is, uh, my medallion is no move nowhere, and TLC uh, suspended, and I didn't work like 10 days. And uh, now I paid money from my wife's work and the money I paid, and that money I uh, give it to TLC, and then now it's, it's okay, but how to transfer to my name, or I look in the market, please buy my medallion, 200,000, because Signature asked me 200,000. I say, please, anybody wants to buy, still I'm here, I can give it 200,000, because that value, the Signature Bank asked me. So thank you so much for having us, for everyone to come here, and all my friends and community. Thank you. Hi, my name is Nina Godashi. I'm a yellow taxi driver and medallion owner. I want you to thank you for your support today. And uh, I want to say zero work is done to help the medallion owners from the city of New York, from the TLC, nobody is helping us as today. We just fighting coming to this room, and everybody I listen, they try to blame the lenders, they try to put it on the brokers, and 99% is the fault of New York City and the state of New York. They robbed us, they took our money, 
and now today they should reembarrass all the yellow cabs. So today I'm fighting for my friends because I'm losing them every day. The person pushed me to buy the medallion. She lost three medallions. She's fighting with cancer and her husband is fighting with heart problems. So, and they have disabled kid. So what these people at the 69 year old, what they can do right now? So I'm answering, I'm questioning you to give me the answer today about my friends I'm losing every day, the people I know. And I need the support. The city has to do something. We need a solution now. We cannot wait anymore. We die in every day. Our people is fighting every day to raise the kids, to bring food on a table. We're not talking about to make money or have investments. We're talking to bring the food on our tables to our kids today. And nobody, I listen to this room, everybody is trying to blame somebody else to put it on our lenders. We was making enough money. You cannot have one million medallion and zero. Give it to somebody for free. We pay one million and you can give it to someone for free. So how this, how you, they're trying to make a playing field. How are you going to make a playing field when you have a million and zero? How are you going to feel, how are you going to make the same playing field? It's impossible. It's really impossible. You cannot. When this costs one million and this costs zero and we make the same money. The people, they work on the 80s, age 80, 90, the retirement. What is their money? Where? How are they going to survive? How are you going to make playing field for these people? How? They cannot work anymore. They cannot find drivers. What are these people are they going to do? Thank you. Okay. My name is Mr. Chaudhry. My book, and I'm driving in here. Thirty years, and I'm 74 now, and I'm not right now. I'm not working, but very difficult for me to survive because nobody leasing, no driver, lot of problem. Everybody complaining, no job, no business. So I'm in that position. I, uh, for me, like lot of driver, those who serve 30 years, 40 years and they now zero. They have no retirement. They can't sell it. Very difficult position. And, and also we want, uh, you know, price and the debt forgiveness because still I have a loan. And I want uh, if city can do, it's highly appreciate for us. Thank you, sir. Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman and uh, all of you guys, I'm talking my personally because I'm driving 1987. <coughs> and since then, uh, uh, I bought medallion once 1998, then I lost somehow, then I bought it in uh, 2006, and still I'm driving. But I have a lot of loan, about like $450,000. <coughs> and right now, my pr pr problem is I don't have no driver. Since, uh, like one year, I don't have no driver, and I'm 65 years old, and I urge you two guys to help me personally, like forgiveness on my um, uh, loan, and uh, I try to be help myself. I have uh, two daughters, uh, one is college, one is like uh, today, uh, I should go to her fifth grade uh, um, graduation, but I came here for a reason. So I cannot go there. So I try to be, you guys try to be help us, forgiveness or monthly payment for $900 a month. And right now I have no driver. I have very hard to pay my mortgage for house or mortgage for uh, medallion. So this is the issue I just telling you guys. So we help us. Thank you very much. And to Nina and all of you like, we will not let you down. We, I under, hope. we understand. I trust you. We understand. You know, we've been in this battle together, 
and this you would know he is here from us in another hearing. We will continue organizing together. As a grassroots organizer that I have been and that we have been, we know that some of the work is at the lazy lady body, but there's gonna be some level that we also are ready to move on and be there with you guys. So listening to the story of this panel, you, you represent I felt only, so bad sorry, last week. Not only the previous one, members of the public, but the future to come. So when we see your faces, you know, you are you know, the group of individuals that we are so committed to hope, rescuing, rescuing, like, you know, not only what you represent for your family, but what you represent for the city. Thank you. Thank you. The next uh, panel consists of Raul Rivera, Johan Nishman, Gamal Omar, Surin Manaktala, um, Furby Sering from Woodside Elmhurst, Aziz Khan, Aziz Khan. Jigmees from 8215 Queens Boulevard, Elmhurst. Um, having trouble deciphering name. Vanad, Vanad, 17 Fountain Street. This earlier, I think we that. You put that one? Yeah, I think earlier. Yeah, some people, some of them wrote more than one. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Great. Uh, Jorge Caporte, uh, Shabal chose goes from the Taxi Alliance. Tariq Minur. Hello. Hi. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. We really appreciate for you this big, 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 very big help. We really appreciate. So, sir, we are really, our situation like really in um, hospital, like ICU. So your help will make us big, feel well. So thank you for giving us debt programs, which is very, very much needed at this very, very hardship financing crisis on us all over. Honorable Praetors, <clears throat> sir, we have no words to thank you. We really <clears throat> appreciate for this. Very important help. This help will not stop another 10th suicide. It will make our faces happy. We face, see face faces happy today, even other today. So this is only with your help we Jews can save our lives. This help will also stop, sell out as our assets, which I just surrendered my all kids' life their policy to the company because they have to pay the, their mortgage fees and their college fees. So, this, <coughs> excuse me. So, send them this help also help professionals who stay in the city work the New Yorkers. This help also make us to help our sick families and members in our road who have no other members to <coughs> take care of them in the emergency time. Like my friend, his mother is sick, like fourth grade cancer in India. He went there, he have to come back here because he have to pay the mortgage, he have to pay the all bills. So that <coughs> that's due, due to his financial crisis. So he, he have to come back USA to pay his loan and other bills. 
after help her mother middle left middle in her treatment so people who unfortunately this your help will also help those people unfortunately whose family members sick in the abroad they cannot go to see them <laughs> this will help to go them there and stay with them until they get well thanks so much with your help this is big help for our children can go college very free we can able to make them tuition free little easy important also our our so uh, sorry so i have another uh, request so we have facing every uh, most drivers facing robberies so last week i got robbed by the four people this they robbed me this slow stole my phone they stole my bag so please do something we can able to uh, get the front up front fair or we can able to see their id something like that thank you so much i appreciate for that and thank you god bless you all so council members thank you so much uh, mr chair stories and the rodriguez and the council members my name is aziz khan i am a medallion owner and the drivers i am working in this industry since 2087 and i had a hope that when i get older around 60 or 65 i'll be happy with the medal i can give to lise and then i can go survive myself with the, my family but all in even everything has been gone under water and you know all the situation has been described and the tlc they collect the money from us and that they not did not answer your question at all they know nothing at all now who is not supposed to and my my question is that the uber and lift come without investing any money they are on the street here and there and in every corner they standing there they wait for the the passenger they come from the second floor third floor and they create the problem to congestion the the, the traffic congestion we don't stay for any anybody we mo keep moving we go, we don't make the congestion in the city so to for, for further congestion you have to stop the over and leave further registration and i am 60 years old and i have no ability i have um, physically unfit to drive and who will my drive cab and who i if i hire a driver they drive one week and then left their cab on the on the city and go away don't pay my, don't pay so how i survive the 4000 dollar 3000 is the loan and another 1000 is the uh, tax insurance and other things so who will make 4000 dollar pay the mortgage and the present valuation my request please sit together and you are the only person who i try to understand us so sit together with the bank and the uh, private owner and the merillion brokers set together and find the solution that the present valuation is how much is the present valuation 150 dollars so fix the price and then wave the left of the money from the bank we cannot pay that whatever the present valuation we want to fix that one then so that the bank will get money or eventually all the merillion will go to the foreclosure then the bank will lose then the bank and the private owner will lose so fix please right here please fix the problem whatever the price is now we are agree to do that one thank you thank you so much thank you good afternoon everybody actually the first time i came in united states it was uh, 1984 i'm medallion owner i'm driving and i have bachelor degree at the medical science and the first time i come in, in jail to this meeting because of one thing i forgave my education to work as a driver to put my future to my kids and what happened i bought my daughter as a in in mid dream medical school and i got the time i couldn't pay the tuition for my kids and my question is we are in a superpower of the world and i'm not going to talk politician but we been served this country more than 20 or 30 years we are part of community and this country 
they can, it's impossible to look us as a hard worker. People come serve part of the community to help us. Is, is, is something going on? Because we are immigrant, because we are not enough educated, because we are work hard, we don't have any union support us, because we are weak union or weak people. I don't think if other people or other part of the city, they have suffering or hardship and they have power union and strong union, do not let their people to be in this kind of situation. We have already nine people got suicide. We have people over seven years still driving. Why the city or why the country, they look to us this lot and we are very hard worker people with suffering just to survive. So please, council, look to us as a human being. We are part of community. We're working hard. We're not, and if you make investigation or search about this kind of people, most of these people educated, they are not part of any criminal or anything. These people work very hard, very honest, and hopefully we can solve this issue. We're not gonna talk for details, but look to us as a human being who try to, to live as good people, that's enough hardship we've been suffered. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Can you please say your name? Gamal Omar. Thank you. Good afternoon, the chairman. I thank you for the work that you have done to put this hearing together. My name is Johan Neyman, and you might know me from a different, but my medallion number is for Apple 28. I'm a medallion owner myself. When I bought my medallion in 1992 for $240,000, I thought I was building something for the future. And my idea was from where I, when I came to this country, where the, where the medallion was and when I bought it, I thought that I would have enough equity to have a pension. Now, I did yellow 10 years and then this four, five, and six start giving me trouble. So I had to lease my medallion and find something else to do. <clears throat> Now, there was no one in this industry that cared about individual drivers. I don't want to hear brokers. I don't want to hear owners, <clears throat> the guys who own 50 and 60 medallions. I don't want to hear them come here and crying that they mean with us, they didn't. The Taxi and Limousine Commission was nowhere to be found to help us wherever we need. The Taxi and Limousine was there for the make their money on the back of drivers, but never for the drivers. Let's be clear on that. After there was a rule in the book, Chairman, I hope you could bear with me so you could hear my story. There was a rule in the book that was called for owner must drive. It was never implemented. And one day, TLC came and implemented that rule <clears throat> to the point that we had to pay about $2,500 if we did not drive. So most of us, our medallion was at the broker. So when the penalties came, the brokers turned on us and said, you have to pay it. And we didn't have the money, so we say, okay, I'm taking my medallion. And what they did, they took us to court. $150,000. They, they sue us as a guy who has a medallion. They sue us, so when they come here today and try to play all this clean, they were the bad actors as well. So we had, I had to settle for $15,000 for my medallion. Got my medallion and I give the broker, Chairman, I want you to listen to me. I give the broker 12 months of payments to pay my medallion. I don't know the exact number, but let's assume it's $4,000. And there were two loans. 
One loan was a balloon, what we call a balloon in the business, and one was for the principal. So I wrote the check for $4,000. That has to be paid, the balloon and the, the principal. They did not pay, pay the balloon. They paid the principal. And within three months, chairman, I come outside one morning to go to work. And my medallion is not in my car. And my meter is not in my car. And this happened on Memorial Day. They wanted to kill me. This happened on Memorial Day. So when they come here and say, lenders are not responsible and this and that, they killed us. There is a lot of story I need to share with you because drivers, individual drivers, that don't have the medallions no more, have nowhere to go, have nothing to fall back on. I am working right now with Uber and Lyft. It's not easy. I'm fighting every day over there for drivers too. But still, the pain, the suffering, my future, everything is gone. I have nothing today. My medallion is gone. Everything is gone. And I didn't ask for that. I wanted to work hard my whole life. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Raul Rivera. I'm a New York City TLC driver. I was born and raised in the Bronx. Mr. Rodriguez, we have a New York City agency that is treating fellow New Yorkers like animals, like criminals. No one gets treated like the New York City taxi driver does. The New York City Taxi and Limousine Commission has grossly failed New York City taxi drivers. More importantly, it has failed your fellow New Yorker. I have been personally sexually assaulted, I have been spat on, cursed at, and so on. Drivers, drivers deserve protection and respect. We move this city and drivers demand a reform of the TLC. Sign my petition and vote for the TLC driver. Do it now. Mr. Rodriguez, 90% of drivers are immigrants with a language barrier. Drivers are being hammered with ticket quotas, both by the NYPD and the TLC. I support Lieutenant Edwin Raymond and the NYPD 12. Let's put a stop to the ticket quotas and let's stop attacking the TLC driver. Mr. Rodriguez, on February 20th, 2019, just days before the election, you agree with me that the Taxi and Limousine Commission needed to be reformed. Stand by your word, sign my petition. Thank you, Councilwoman Kalina Rivera for signing my petition. Thank you, Families for Safe Streets for supporting my petition. I have a message for Margaret Chin, Corey Johnson, Idani Rodriguez, Andy King, Ruben Diaz Seniors, Carlos Manchaca, Richie Torres, and all city council members, don't ignore the TLC driver. Vote for the TLC driver. Sign my petition. Do it now. New, York, New Yorkers are watching you. Hashtag reform TLC. Hashtag do it now. Do it now. I got it right here. You can sign my petition. Right here. Thank you, Chairperson. Uh, my name is Tariq Munir. I am an immigrant uh, here uh, for a good dream. Um, I am uh, a taxi driver since uh, 1991. So 20, almost 27 years I am driving taxi. So first 20 years uh, I drive taxi and save money like $100,000. Then I put that money down payment, 20 years money put down payment and uh, buy the medallion high, high prices. So in this time the prices goes very low. So I mean, uh, that uh, uh, my, my 20, 20 years is a saving and uh, the next seven years are my, uh, I mean, uh, uh, next seven years uh, only goes to my diabetes and uh, uh, sickness only. So I urge to say that uh, for gifts, that's, that's the uh, loans and uh, uh, the, 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 the loan of, of the value of the medallion and the uh, uh, rest of the money make the lower uh, interest rate and uh, the monthly lower payment to like uh, less than 900 or uh, less than 900 should be. Thank you very much, please. Thank you, everyone. And of course, we are working on reforming TLC. That's what we're doing. So, yeah, so all the voices is important. So this are in today and all, and, and all the bills that we have reflect how committee we are to reform the TLC. Thank you. Chairman, 
Would you allow me to make one suggestion to you, if you will? Chairman, can I ask you if you could work towards a pension fund for the guys who lost their medallion? A pension fund that could give them something, because when MT was in trouble, they came to Yellow. When the city was in trouble, they came to Yellow. Tax, the Tax and Limousine Commission yeah. can give back by give this drive. We, we are committed to explore any ideas, suggestions, so after you leave, uh, when you step out, one of our staff can, you know, talk to you and take your ideas, your suggestions. Appreciate it. Thank you Thank very you. much. Thank you. Ms. Pano. And Warby sit on me from 32-1270 Street. Mohamed Mabu Akur Akhtar Hassan. Mohamed Huam Atiar. Ragmer, Duana Hittes, Hittesel, Mark Esselberg, Excellent, Dalip Singh, Dorothy Leconte. Mohammed Ashahim Sami Megali Miss you may begin Good afternoon my name is Dorothy Leconte, and um, I've been driving a medallion for the past 32 years. I was very young when I started, and I'm, I'm well known at the airport. I'm one of everybody's sisters, everybody's friends, and I'm well known a lot of Haitian cab drivers. And uh, I tell you, with my medallion, I chose my medallion. I used to say, this is my husband because I have two divorces because of the medallion. I never have times. I was very ambitious. I spent my time, I raised two sons. I spent all my time doing this business. For the past seven or eight years, we have an Uber being introduced to us, breaking up the business. I understand how long I used to work very hard, pay my bills. I understand the loan was very bad because I know. I took my, uh, all my contract, take it to a lawyer. They said this is a bad loan, but there's nothing we can do. Nobody can help. So we, we take it easy with it. But I used to work and pay the bill easily. I used to go on vacation. I haven't gone time to go on vacation at all. So I'm looking at this business hall, things going down. My main concern right now is the congestion prices. You could know, we, each customer pay $2.50 plus the 80 cents at $3.30, but Uber only pay 75 cents per customer. And they call themselves sharing ride, they only, one person of the car, they pay 75 cents, they got the choice. We have days that, like on Fridays, like this week, this Friday, this weekend past here, was uh, all the uh, uh, gay people outside, they all enjoying themselves. That, that was to be the day that I'm making so much money. I've been driving from Harlem all the way down with nobody picking up. Every corner, we got a couple people waiting for uh, Uber. We can't make our payment. But the thing is, with the prices, the way the mortgage goes, I don't understand how a bank calling somebody to say, give me $250,000, you owe me $700,000, forget about the rest. Why the city don't st step in? 
because we don't have $250,000. If I have $250,000, I'd be gone by now because I'm still healthy. I could go in outside and work somewhere else and save my $250,000 for my payment. We have another point. I have my friend here. He couldn't talk today. He came too late. He's talking about the accessory, the wheelchair. I understand the wheelchair is the government. We have the federal law. We have to put car in a wheelchair. But his main concern, TLC have to know a person who's old cannot push a wheelchair. He's already an old person, cannot push a wheelchair. He has to be exempt. You have to take another young person as his side. He cannot push the wheelchair. His medallion been on shelf for the past five years because of the wheelchair. He has to take mortgage from his own pocket, from his uh, uh, social security to pay for the mortgage because he cannot work. So all this issue, TLC have to look at it because there's so many young people driving cars, he, they could switch for him to go in, the wheelchair could go to a younger. They could look at the age. I'm 62, I'm a woman. You think I'm gonna push a wheelchair to a car? I can't. But there's so many medallions out there who's willing to go into wheelchair, but TLC will not make the switch. So all this problem here, it's in your hands, and I'm glad that you take all matter to your hands, not now, because I have people who have stroke, I have people <laughs> die in the car. I work seven days a week, and I'm watching young people, people older than me, suffering, sleeping in their own car because they become homeless. They have to rent a car from the brokers seven days a week to drive in a car to make a living because they have no home. Their wife is leaving them, all of these things. So we're waiting for you guys. And I'm gonna keep on pushing and I'm gonna be here in every meeting to see, the mayor promised me he's gonna keep my job. That's what Mayor de Blasio, I met him several times. I go to town hall meeting, I ask him to save my pension because I have nothing left. Because even my house not now, it's under it's merged with the medallion. I'm on a way to lose everything. So Thank please. You. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Chairman uh, Rodriguez and uh, Torres, and all other um, very important person and our friends and family. Take my salam. Assalamu alaikum. We are here today. We are very crisis. And um, my question is: Today is my bad luck. I bought a metro card. But every tips I collect the three dollar from customer for the MTA. But today I buy for myself the metro card. What is the worth? I don't know. I collect every day thirty to fifty dollar for the MTA. Second thing, sir, you want to come to city four o'clock in every blocks Fifth Avenue, Madison and Sixth Avenue. Every blocks thirty car, thirty car is twenty five car is Uber, Lyft, Bia. Only for two cars is a taxi. When the publish on the TV news or the um, uh, newspaper, they take the picture is news media. Couple of taxi and only for two car is Uber. This is the lying. I don't know who controls the city, governor or mayor. I don't know. We are taxi industry is the the sinkhole is a, like Titanic. Who help us? I don't know. Thank you, Mr. Rodriguez and the Maurice. Your question. Asking the Mr. Chairman, they don't give any answer. I don't know. I have my idea. Who is the top of executive in any department? He is the hard body student or Columbia graduate. I think so. TLC Chairman is my behind the next door school, Long Island City. He graduated from Long Island City as his quality. So thank you for um, Rodriguez and the Morris. So I want to help your uh, cooperation. So your proposal and what you describe is very good for me. I'm 56 years old. <laughs> My medallion is a big mortgage. I don't know when I pay off. Maybe next month, next year, my medallion, uh, my car is retired. Maybe I give up the um, bank and I jump on the East River. This is my plan. You know, woman, every woman like a money, not a mouth. So I don't give any money in my wife. I have no driver. Last four years, I'm advertising so many my local paper and my media also. Nobody call me. Thank you. Good afternoon. I am Mohammed Hawk, and I am that Mohammed Hawk. You can see me in the New York Times, May 19. How horrible is my family life? I bought one medallion 2014. It was one million dollar, and final closing was one million ninety-one thousand plus. 
and my broker is the Omega. They tow my car five times. Every time they tow, they asking the cash money on the or the certified said that's the record here. Last time they took my medallion with the car, March 18, it was now their hand. I have three kids, they are ages eight plus, three plus, and six month. Four month, even I don't have my car. So this horrible situation right now I have for me. After bought this medallion, I took now more than 12 medication daily, not before 2014, after that. Now I can sleep properly, you know, I don't have car. I spend here around 200,000 and last five years I struggle behind the bills. Now I have three kids, they are two, are not in the school with the feeder. So nothing left, I spend my savings, I spend my hard working money, now, like I'm newborn here, I spent, I lost everything. So now I have a request. I feel everybody, they want to help us. We are hardworking people. We want to move to the city. And also our family, we need to survive. Please help. Please, I have a loan now, 915,000. They give me the last time before tow my car, this before seize my car, the 50 year. I have to pay one person, so it's not going to be help. They need 6,000 right the way. I say I don't have that amount of money. So then they took my car. So now I am out of work, out of car, and I have a family, three kids. I need everyone help. Please try to realize our situation, our family and personal life. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rodriguez. Thank you, Mr. Torres. And uh, thanks to be Mayor de Blasio. And I got a special thanks to Brian, New York Times reporter. He's a very friendly reporter. He went our home and talked to families, all those information, that's real. And he published on New York Times. And thanks again. My point is, we need loan forgiveness. Whatever I, we say, a lot of stops, but we need loan forgiveness. And, and the surcharge. The surcharge is like we are almost the last, uh, last thing they, the, the, the governor did. We uh, put our shoulder to surcharge, and that surcharge is killing us uh, rapidly. And TLC, the most unfriendly organization in city. They are really kind of, I'm not going to say what butcher, but they are. And they kill us. They kill us once because they revoke my license. Tomorrow, my drug test, and I just put the wrong date on the, my calendar, and I did explain to them, they said, no way, your license is gonna be revoked, because tomorrow is your drug test, and you, you, you cannot go, because everybody office is closed now. They're not gonna allow me to tomorrow drug test. And that's why they revoked my license, and three months, I was hungry with my kids and family. They not even look at me once, and they not gave me every, uh, just a new driver. I exam again, I test again, all those things, and I come back on the taxi after three months. And I'm the medallion owner. When I bought the medallion owner, they said you are the ambassador of New York City because you are a YOLO taxi driver. And after that situation is now, you see, you hearing from everyone the situation. So I'm not gonna go that way. The last word my mother, son, I wanna see you. I said, mom, I can't give you answer why I can't come. My mother died three months ago. And I never gonna get her. But thanks to the commission, thanks to Mr. Chairman, 
I am talking in front of you. That's my luck. And I hope the problem is going to be solved and we're going to back everyone the golden time that taxi was. And TLC, again, TLC is not a right commission for us. TLC, uh, when I heard that they're going to open up office for drivers, I said, oh, again. So that's why I oppose that. TLC not going to solve our problem. If city will, yes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. My name is uh, Surin Manaktala. I thank you, everyone, again uh, for uh, patiently listening to all of us. I'm an individual taxi owner and driver, and I'm a member of uh, Taxi Alliance. And uh, I wish we had a bigger union, like all the other unions in the city who have a better voice uh, at the council and the, uh, in the state. When we why we are collecting the taxes for the state, taxi medallion owners are under big stress by MTA state and city rules. It's not our fault that city has too much traffic congestion or MTA can't function properly. It's in fact city and state fault who ignored the dire situation city was going when they issued thousands of new medallions and for higher vehicle licenses and failed to ignore MTA crises and contracts. Please help medallion owners by asking banks to help refinance the loans so their monthly payments can go no more than 900 a month. I have over 200,000 credit debts on my credit cards because I can't keep up the mortgages. Thousands more will go bankrupt and become liability to the city and other tax-paying citizens. We can't keep paying 4,000 a month mortgage and taxes. We have to feed our families and pay our debts. Please understand our plight and make our lives livable. We are the representatives and ambassadors of New York City to the tourists of the world. Treat us like humans. We want a stronger union in good faith to negotiate with the TLC and the state. I don't understand how come the state is governing the medallions when the medallions were originally issued by the city. We want the city to help us negotiate debt forgiveness with the banks. City should pay back to the owners which was stolen from them. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my name is Sammy Megali. It's just a coincidence, you know, usually when I wake up every morning, you know, I go online and read the news and they're talking about loan forgiveness. And I read today that, you know, Mr. Bernie Sanders, if he becomes a president, he's going to wipe off a student loan for $1.4 trillion. $1.4 trillion. Young people, healthy and they're going to start their life with, like, brand new, not nothing. And how about us? We spent all our life working hard, trying to do the right thing, and now we are paying for a problem that we did not create, a crisis that is ruining our life. The nine people, the nine people that committed suicide, they died fast, but we are dying slowly. Little by little, and it is very painful. It is very painful that since the middle of 2016, in my age, I haven't taken a day off. I didn't take a day off. It's a human rights. It's not just a normal problem. It's a human rights problem. Labor law says you would work eight hours a day, and you take a day or two, day, uh, two days off a week. <laughs> I'm not even a human. I'm worse than a human, you know. It's like an animal working like, you know. It's, it's, you, uh, an, you, it's an animal. You work and you don't, pay, you don't open your mouth. 
few months ago, I, I got a, a, a problem in my lung. And uh, I have to go for a, a, a medical t a test and, uh, and see what's wrong with me. And I took a, a, a week off, a week off just to see what's wrong with me. And uh, I paid my monthly payment. I was short 1,050. My bank, I have the paper here, sir. You want to foreclose my medallion because of 1,050. I'm not even entitled to see what's wrong with me. I have to die just to pay the bank I, the, and the congestion tax and the, the MG tax and the 30 cents tax. If, every day I ask myself, what I'm doing to myself? I'm dying little by little and what, 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 what I'm going to get in the end? I need the vacation. I'm dying to get a vacation, but I can't believe me, to, believe me Mr. Chairman, I cannot get it. Thank you. <laughs> The next panel, uh, uh, Alex Menard, Doral Groy, Anna Lama, um, can't quite make out the name, but someone from 103, 20, 168 place. Jezvir from 234 East 20th Street, the Bronx. Karamol Hader. Uh, Ruben for 420 42nd Street. Upkar Thind. Mr. Shroudtree. Sonam from 4152 63rd Street, Woodside. Mr. Tashi from Woodside. Ahed Ahmed. Mr. Ahmed. Mohammed Hassan. So this should be the last panel. Yes, sir, your name first. Uh, my name is Karimul Haidar. I am the medallion owner. <coughs> uh, about almost 10 years, I think. Uh, thank you, Chairman, and thank you all councillors and uh, other delegates. And um, uh, hopefully uh, the New York Times, uh, who has here, uh, when, when we buy the medallion, we have a hope there's good business, at good li we can, we can uh, create the good life. After the TLC or city, I don't know about the, the cheetahs. What kind of cheetahs? Because they sell medallion close to a med uh, million dollar at overnight, they give to permission to they don't solve us. They don't give the permission to other department, other, other transportation. That is the cheat, cheating. Because we have a million dollar on my head, and after they sign up free business, other company. So who gonna be take care of us? Secondly, everybody has life. Everybody has human life. Right now, we are like a slave. We work, say, eight day a week because we don't have any driver. Six months, I'm waiting for the driver, and still now I'm driving my own self. Last night, I was in home, one o'clock. My daughter asked me, Dad, can you buy the uh, food for me, like this food? I bought it. but. After two hours, I go home. I, when I go home, I saw my daughter is sleeping with a hungry 
she was hungry. I called, she can wait. That is the life right now we're living. This is the example. Are you, when a situation created like this, first time I opened my mouth, I called my old friends, he has all friends, 200 people. The, we are, we are, we are, we are make a group, and we go to hearing to two years before the uh, uh, TLC public hearing, two and a half years before, I think so. And I tell them, when I, when I get to speak, I say, take the gun, I say to the commissioner, take the gun, shoot us. What the mean? Do something. Otherwise, kill us, because we don't have any space behind. Because we are situation going to be very, very tough. I understand, I understood before. Because that time nobody wants suicide. I request the TLC, they take the gun, shoot us. That means we don't have any space. Because in, in tomorrow going to be dark, our life. We can survive. TLC can do nothing. It's still now TLC can do nothing. We go to, we call the TLC, we make an appointment, we go to Bibari Street and 17th floor, the Aston Commissioner Charles Ferry sit down with us. I bring the lawyer, Maurice, he's living in Brooklyn, very nice guy, he tried to help, help us. The lawyer and my other friends and me, three persons, we sit down. They talk maybe one and a half hour. If you, if you can conclude, that's just in the interest of time. No, give me two minutes. No, no we, we have. Okay, 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 sir. Okay, okay, okay. I think 20 speakers left, so. Uh, okay, so because it, I work two and a half, half years, this one. I have a long history. No, I know. That's why, okay. About that, TLC can do nothing. And right now, this is the, the city hall, the public hearing. We have a very hope because the, the, the New York Times work with, uh, I work with them 15 days, I think so. Brooklyn, Jackson Heights, and Jamaica with the brand, you know, reporter brand. Yeah. And uh, they say the wait for August the city can do, do something. Okay. City can do something, wait for August. Maybe people know okay. the so city can do nothing, uh, we, city can, can do something. No. That's why nobody on suicide. We, we, if after August you can so, do nothing, so, so a lot of people are going to be suicide. We're going to have to go to the next speaker, but I... Thank you I, very much, I sir. appreciate your testimony. Do something now, otherwise no. tomorrow going to be another guy suicide. Because we are, well, they are waiting for, look at the city. Okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Hello. <clears throat> uh, my name is Ruben Finkel, um, and um, I'm surprised and uh, thankful that you are so aware of the scope and the depth of the problem and that you are on this fact-finding mission to expose uh, the full extent of the corruption, the obscenity of all the members, all the particular people and elements involved with this cash grab, uh, and as a result, the decimation of my industry. Um, <clears throat> one of the things um, that others have uh, brought up that I want you to make further, uh, make further aware to you about is the um, uh, the TLC's use of uh, penalties and fines to further um, uh, extract monies out of the industry and the drivers and the owners of the uh, of the taxi industry. And as an example. Uh, one of the drivers that called the police on an individual that assaulted him with a weapon and assaulted the driver um, physically uh, was fined by the, P uh, the TLC for $50,000 in fines and penalties for calling the police on the assailant. That was their justification for fining the driver. 
Um, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, um, I think also that um, if, if um, at the end of your uh, exploration uh, that you, um, uh, okay, <laughs> okay. Yeah, just quickly it. conclude. Okay, that at the end of uh, your uh, investigations that um, you're able to, um, um, uh, 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 find liability in all those members that uh, all the people that were involved with this that would be fine but uh, in the future if you don't regulate the boundaries the guidelines of how the transportation industry in New York City is operated then when automation comes in will be subjected to this uh, tenfold because every car industry, every car company, every uh, transportation service in the world, including uh, Dyson, a vacuum company, is going to become part of the transportation industry. And without regulation, they'll just come in as Uber did uh, and operate with impunity as Uber did. And I hope that uh, you create regulations that create guidelines for future uh, taxi industry. Thank you. Okay. My name is Masun Chaudhary. Yeah. And, and I am driving taxi from 1988 and Every time I find it was okay before I used to work eight hours. Now I have to, 12 hours, 13 hours I had to work in order to maintain myself, my bill, mortgages and everything. Everything is getting very hard and hard. And after the shift, uh, all these conjunction charges come up 50, 60 dollar goes to the conjunction charge which is killing us, you know, and some of the passenger is very irritating about this charge. And I, I would want to, I, I would like to let you know, conjunction charge, Saturday, Sunday, people complain, why Saturday? There is, why after 12 o'clock, one o'clock in the conjunction charge? It's supposed to be, if you want to put it up in the rush hours conjunction charge, it's okay, maybe people justify it. Sometimes another one problem we always face, they make it to Fifth Avenue, two bus lane now. Madison Avenue, two bus lane now. And buses all coming to other lane too. And we cannot move. I pick a passenger from Guggenheim Museum to go to the 40th, uh, 40th Street, Fifth Avenue, and he was over there, about $30 his bill cup come up to, because he cannot move. And this guy finally throws money and get out. This kind of th thing we are experiencing. You're supposed to l let us ride, you know, no stopping, no pick up something, but we can run in the bus lane. In London, they allow the taxi driver to run in the bus lane. No stopping, no pick up, but we are also, uh, serving the passenger. Bus is serving more, we are serving less, but we are doing the same job. And we are, mind you that another thing, we are raising money for them in order to finance them. They are problem MTA, and we are paying money in order to pay this, and we are, we are dying for that and I would like to take care of this matter. And another thing about the insurance, you know, the workman compensation, which is kill us because no driver likes to work. My brother, he cannot put a driver over there because workman compensation is too much. And, and he died himself, he's 70 years old because he said workman compensation, all these things, it's too much money. Every time I wanted to change the driver, they raised it, uh, insurance. This, you know, the, I think you better lo look on this matter. This is a big problem. 
because workman compensation, I don't know anybody, any driver get any money. When you claim for the workman compensation, they don't give money or something like that. They take $10 and give, even they did not give 50 cents to us back. So I never, 30 years, I never had any workman compensation or something unnecessary, everything, all this burden putting on us and taking our, ripping our money. Sir, you sir know, if you can, if you can thank you conclude, so thank you. Hello, good evening, uh, <clears throat> Mr. Chair, Councilman, and uh, President, uh, our brothers, and uh, <coughs> the Honorable Prish. So my name is uh, MD uh, Mohammed Abdul Mutalib. I'm the driver owner. I, this is my personal history. I bought this, uh, I started uh, the driving 2003. I saving my money to buy the medallion. It was a dream to buy my medallion. So I bought, 2009, I bought my medallion $600,000, putting down $100,000 $100, in my cash money. So it was dream to buy, and I was dreaming to have a better life. So, since the 2009 is going well until 2014, so after 2014, when we see the different field, that yellow, when I bought this medallion, so we knew that the yellow is, is, is for the city. Yellow is in city. Yellow means city. So the people trust the yellow. That's why we invested. I invested. I bought it for dreaming my life. So in 2014, since 2009 to 2014, it's going well. So in 2014, uh, we see the different fail. It's not, not, for the sea, uh, not for the city for the uh, yellow. It's uh, for the different. We bought it, the medallion, for the <coughs> from the city. And city sold, sold the ground to other person. We don't understand. What's, what is wrong here? So we need the real solution. The many brothers asking for the death forgiveness, this and that. So that's my question, is to find the real solution. What is going on? We need our ground back. If we don't get our ground back, it's never going to happen. Yellow is not going to stay here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair and City Council member and New York Times representative. Thank you for hearing. Um, my name is Ahad Ahmed. I'm living in uh, Belrose, Queens. Uh, I am driving Medallion taxi cab since 1982. Oh, sorry, 1984, and I brought medallion first tea auction from the TLC. And it was my dream. I, when I go to retirement, then I do something, I rent or give it to the broker and I, I can do nothing and stay home. This dream is Dad, I have, I, I had another dream. I earn money and spend my children. One is uh, two children. One is went to the burning house, burning town, uh, upstate, the uh, state university, and was dream was his and my he become a lawyer. 
after his graduation, he can go to the law college because I don't have a money I can afford him. He's still home, no job, and I taking care of my family. My Belrose home, one family, is right now on foreclosure. If somebody buy from the bank or what are you going to do? Are you going to do uh, the state? I don't have anything to leave. Please do something for us, not for me, only for my this situation. A lot of my brothers have, I think, this situation. And we have neglect. We go to the city, pick up passenger from the hotel, completely yellow taxi is no pick up from there. We kick out from the doorman. We go to the pickup. Especially I work now at night. And last night I, I dropped the one passenger, 96 Street, Second Avenue. I take the Lexington all the way downtown, then come in the Park Avenue, then come Eighth Avenue, east to west, north to south, no passenger. Then I think I go to uh, club. There is two, three club on 16th Street between 8th and 9th. I went there and I see so many um, illegal people standing in the uh, super van, something like this, and doorman, one of doorman or some, somebody, okay, get out from here. I say, I want to pick up passenger. I don't get any passenger. If you, One if you, hour. If you can conclude. Yes, sir. If so he, he, he kick out me. Where, where are we going on a pickup? We can pick up people from the uh, airport. We can pick up for, for, uh, people from the uh, hotel. This is our uh, suggestion right now. And we, we can drive, you know, uh, right, uh, a lot of uh, Uber, leave this and that, and I don't know where I'm going to. I, I have 60 years old, and I have a diabetes. And I am working six days, 12, 13 hours. I can afford my family. I can afford my uh, two mortgage house and medallion mortgage. I, I, st um, I can because my, my mother was hospital and she died uh, after uh, one week. I can work like two, three weeks, I behind. And my broker took the car one day. One guy come like 12 o'clock at my home, knock door and say, give your car, uh, key. I said, who, give your taxi key. I said, who are you? He said, I'm detective. They took the car. And after uh, one, uh, next day, I borrow money from my uh, relative, my uh, brother-in-law, sister-in-law, and still I don't give them. I pay six thousand dollars, then they give me the car. Right. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you for all of you here. Thank you. Uh, my name is Mohammed Hussain. Uh, I drive taxi. Uh, see, uh, 1996, uh, I'm sorry, 98, and I'm a member of Taxi Worker Alliance. I bought a taxi from last auction, uh, 2014, and uh, I invest here is 138 grand, and I work seven days sometimes more than 10 hours a day. I work as same as doggy, so I don't have a time for my family and money, nothing. I, even I don't have a, enough money to pay my bill. So uh, my broker uh, did not tell me anything about the loan agreement. What is the bill loan? Even I don't know. I paid for lawyer, but I don't have a lawyer. The broker tell me completely lie. My income is to earn less than $25,000. How I get a loan 
750 grand. I want to talk to the New York Times, Mr. Ryan, he explained to me my loan of agreement, and he asked me how long he spent to sign this agreement. And, and I, I told him, I spent only this sign 10 to 15 minutes, not more than 15 minutes. And I'm asking to Mr. Brian is here, so how long you spend time to read this paper and you sign this paper agreement? And he said, I need one hour. So my paper is everything here. So he's a reporter, he's a super fast. He is a not ordinary people. He needed 24 uh, uh, this time and I needed 48 hours. And I have a, another question. The how, how set the price, the Marillion auction is high bid price. I said the New York State is, is uh, robbed my money. Uh, city, how they work, sell to the Marillion, and how give to the permission to the work to the app company. The city, the know, the state, the know what's the going on, because I'm the last person to buy the Marillion. The state, the, they knows what the going to Marillion. This is the artificial, the, they know their Marillion price will be dropped, is the balloon. Is, it, will, it will, you know, this, everybody knows. So I need two money back. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. So, the next panel, Jacqueline Hassan. Thank you, thank you. Masoon Shokdari. Shamuel Malkil. Abdul Rat. Purba Sherpa. Elvi Indiai. Mohammed Hassan, Jano Beg, Jonathan, Mob Kadir. So, if there was anyone from the public that I did not call, sir, you may come. Greg, and you, if you testify, it's only about this topic, okay? Great. Yep, please. Come in, if you haven't, yeah. You may begin, sir. You may start. Good afternoon to you. My name is Mr. Wusini Celestin. I've been driving a uh, taxi since 1979, Yellow Cab 1982. I purchased my medallion on 1983. Now, after fully driving, I still can walk, even I got a can, but I'm still, I'm able to walk. My medallion sit on storage. My, my, my medallion come on wheelchair. My medallion was uh, a regular medallion. Now, the TLC told me is Mr. Como, is uh, the state, put the medallion on wheelchair, which is I'm not able to drive the accessible car and then to push the to push someone. So my medallion sit on story since four years. I never get I never make one penny on it. I got to pay the medallion every month. I think I can say this is the main reason I'm here. And then the press the price the medallion come down. I cannot pay the full amount. I got to pay the interest every month. Because in case I lost the medallion, they're going on after my hours. I've been working for 40 years. So I'm here to ask you, please do something for me, at least to get an exemption for me to, to purchase a normal car to drive because the wheelchair, I cannot do it. If I left the medallion seat 
on, on story for four years, that means I cannot drive it. So please help me out. Thank you. All right. All of my friends, very painful. I am one of them. So <clears throat> I appreciate all of you. Thank you. My name is Shubesh Boiragi, medallion owner. My medallion number is 4W31. I bought it last auction 2014. After body it, I am killing myself. I am driving since 1998. Before I didn't buy medallion <coughs> because it's too much headache. So I drive taxi from Omega Brokerage weekly, weekly lease. Once a day, I went to deposit my lease money to Omega. Her name is Eleni. She told me, why you take <coughs> lease from us? You have to own boss. <coughs> Today is the last auction. She took me to the boss. His name is Sabas. He told me, if you interested to buy, you have to fill up like 800 to 900, you can get it. Otherwise, not possible. Then, <clears throat> then sounds 50 50. If you fill up to 9 to 10, uh, 100,000, it's 100%. If you fill up 900, um, 100 to more, you 100%, you get it. So day by day, I am going to seek, I cannot drive <coughs> I am driving four years along, no driver, because this is handicap, no driver. No driver cannot like it, handicap. I am right now sick. <clears throat> I am, I have home mortgage, I have three kids, one going to university, another one is Stevenson High School, another one gift and talent school. I take care, I cannot take care of them. Little of my children every day crying, where, where is my dad? Where are you? Come home, don't go, I don't like too much work. <clears throat> But I am very, very frustrated right, uh, right now. Please summarize. <clears throat> so please help, help us. Right now, TLC price is one, not more than 150. If you give me 150, I can afford it. If you mortgage like 150, I can afford it. Otherwise, I have to deposit it. Thank you, sir. Please, please help us. Please help us. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon to you, our Chairman Rodriguez and Torres, and the old, all the City Council. Uh, my name is Mr. Uh, Jonathan Janovics. I'm driving since 1970. Um, <clears throat> I bought my first medallion with my brother many years ago for nine thousand dollars, and over the years. I've seen that the medallion prices went up and what I sold, I bought, and the last, the last time I bought was in 2006, because uh, I've seen for, for, the, for the last 30 years or something that the price kept on going up, and that was a prosperous business. So when I bought in 2006, and I bought from my friends and uh, my, my, my relatives close to $100,000, and also with the money I saved over the years to put down on a medallion which would be ultimately would be my American dream. From the American dream became the American nightmare. I'm, all, I'm single, I'm all by myself, I work seven days a week. Recently I, I, lost, I lost my driver over a year ago and I can't make ends meet. 
Uh, I, we need, and I need def desperately, the uh, medallion, uh, I mean, uh, the debt reduction program that you, you're talking about, that they're going to bring the, the, uh, um, the, the mortgage every month down a little bit, a lot. Currently, I'm paying with insurance and everything close to $3,800 a month. I cannot make it. Uh, <clears throat> I'm on the verge of about going into bankruptcy because the business is not there because of Uber, because of all the influctuation, the influctuation of Uber, over 100,000 cars on the streets. No one, no one, either, no one even wants to 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 uh, to, uh, to hire uh, to hire um, to hire a yellow, you know, cab. Everyone, everyone stands on the corner with the with the phone, Uber, Uber, Uber. So, and besides the point, when I bought in 2006, they had the, they had the program Alternative Fuel Medallion. I went into it because I, I liked a, a bigger car, but, but the whole system was, was, uh, was, was very flow, you know what I mean? I had big tanks in the back. My, my, my car didn't take no, no, uh, no gasoline whatsoever. Because of that, because of that, I had check engine light and I had to go to thousands and thousands of dollars just to repair the, the thing and because no one in New York City knew how to repair the system. And sometimes, sometimes I left the car for two or three months in the taxi limousine commission in the storage because, uh, you know, no, no one knew how to fix that system. I liked, I liked the big car and that's why. Because of that, I went to a debt of $90,000, which I'm about to lose my medallion because of the whole situation. Thank you, sir. Okay. Good afternoon. My name is Dorina Nitsescu. Uh, my issue is for uh, my uh, refinancing. My medallion, it's, uh, I was rent to the broker. My husband, I lost my husband a couple of months ago. So after my husband died, the broker still come, cut my check. My last uh, check for this month was cut and he sent me a big letter, all expensive, you have to pay. So now I'm in the middle to the bank to negotiate my loan to the bank and broker. So my loan is still high and I, I don't have money to cover. And it's not just my loan, I have expensive, my place where I live, my rent, my other expensive and my funeral husband, I was not ready to bury my husband. My husband fight for this issue. Look, those old letter my husband make. He came for all the protest. Two weeks ago, I went to Albany. I spoke with the senator, I showed the letter. He make a copy for me. And I'm in between bank and broker. The broker, he want to, uh, he invite me to do bankruptcy. After, if I do that, he can take my, 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 my asset and to, he's gonna sell. That was my retire, me and my husband. We work, we pay taxes, we are honor people in this country. I have a good job, he, he worked very hard, but he died. He cannot take the pain. He had issue with health, heart problem. And I don't know what I'm gonna do. I'm, my age, my retire is gone, my husband is gone, and the bank, when I, they called me last week, they say we cannot do better than that. The, my loan is still high, and my broker still cut my, my check every month. I don't know next month how my letter is gonna be, my check how it's gonna be. So I live after my husband died with those issues. Can you help us? Can you help me? I don't know what is going to happen. Thank you. I'm sorry too. Chair Torres, Chair Rodriguez, General Counsel, Greg Waltman, um, speaking from G1 Quantum Clean Energy Company. Hearing the testimony from um, medallion owners and, you know, comes down to a few issues. You have market mechanisms that are, have conflicts of interest, like um, Chair Torres pointed out, that sometimes the administration's interests in market making activity, whether it be Uber, undercut medallion auctions, and then that leaves the debt burden. And then you have Chair Levin, who spoke upon collateral debt obligations or 
a CDO that could be packaged to and tethered to the city so you could refinance and offset the loss that medallion owners have incurred. But then it also becomes, okay, well, is Uber better structured and position the market, other Lyft better position market? Does the TLC need to restructure its business to an extent in that, in that, uh, within that regard? And, and, and when we, we talk about collateral debt obligations and securitizing them to offset the debt that these, you know, these owners have incurred, you know, where you, where you turn to the revenue, I mean, I don't want to go back to solar and parsing through the Green New Deal, Amazon value narratives and, and, and those things, but when you can contractually um, originate that asset from New York, a solar contract, and then offset that CDO that these, these people have incurred and the debt that these people have incurred, then you can create the type of synergy you need to to then advance and, and kind of, you know, kill two birds with one stone and leave that type of issue in the value lake where it belongs. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm not to speak very well because I'm not an educated person <coughs> in America. I come here in 1995. I come, my one neighbor, friend, and I believe him in too much. I started taxi driving in 1998, and I make some money, and I go to Ohio City, and I lost $150,000. And I come back to New York, and my room, roommate, he want to buy a medallion. He has only $1,000, $1,100 his account. He want to buy one medallion. And then he asking me money. I said, okay, we can buy together. I have a, some problem in Ohio problem, so you can buy your name. I can give you half of investment. We invest $60,000, dollars 2007, we bought first medallion, 7F19. And then we refinanced the first medallion to buy second medallion. He gave me $160,000 to buy medallion. Melrose gave me a money just one word. He said that he was my partner. And then Melrose gave me another medallion, 1F18. And after that, my partner, he sued me in a Supreme Court. He said that he's not my partner. I am his driver. Yes, I am his driver. Why he gave me $160,000 to buy second medallion? And I lost the first division court. Just the, just the uh, guilty me $210,000, this is 9% interest. I do second division, and second division said judgment is not correct, but my lawyer, they don't work for me. The lawyer, he bought my lawyer because he do fall sue me. I have so many proof, I cannot speak very well, and I told my lawyer, don't do hearing, and I lost the second division. I paid him $255,000 in a cash, I have a loan right now, 740. I tried last year in my bank, Aspire Bank, give me the modification, <laughs> they don't give me, I give only interest, and this is my medallion last November, and then after I paid another $3,000 in, in fine, then he give me medallion back. I, I cannot afford it, $4,000 mortgage, please give me a modification. Then last week he give me the modification, and I still working. I don't want to do chapter uh, seven because I bring some money by house in my country and I buy house this country. And I, I, I feel bad. I can say to in city, New York City, I have a highest price, Maryland price, 1.3 million. I have a Maryland, my, my Maryland price cost. I still feel bad is that they do false suit against me and they choose me. I lost $500,000. All money I lost, my, my income money. I have a loan 740. Still, I do continue my medallion. Please Thanks. help me to punish my partner. Please help me. I, I, I explain to expect to you, and I, I, I need help to punish another, my 719 medallion owner, how he sue me in a false sue in the Supreme Court. Thank you, sir. Please help Thank me. Thank you. I, I appreciate it too. If I, 
if I do help me to do something to my partner. Thank you. Before they have, they have, they, they have also in a buy house. They bought also, uh, also the, in bronze apartment. How they do false you? Please help me to do something. Thank you. Uh, before uh, my co-chair, Councilmember Torres, uh, officially close the hearing, I would like to say that uh, we appreciate the great job that the committee, the Councilmember Torres chair, and all the staff for the great work that they've been doing for the last couple of months. And I know that their contribution will be very important as we from the Committee of Transportation will continue looking at how to bring a solution to this crisis. So this cannot be yes, another hearing two months from now. As we said before, this level of crisis uh, demand uh, action right now, and we will continue working together to be sure again that we give the dignity, the respect to all the men and women the drivers, but those individual medallion owners, because we have said over and over, over, the city has failed, and this is my stand. And I, it's not the first time that I say. I believe that we all the new fact that the committee chair of council member Torres you know, were able to discover, we will continue making a strong case, and. We as a city have to be responsible. The plan cannot wait alone. We cannot wait for another individual medallion owner or driver to take away their life. And that's our call to any men and women that we know that work so hard, please. It doesn't matter how tough the moment is right now. You think about our families before, you know, in those tough moments, you think or you thought go through your mind about you know committing suicide. So hopefully we will become stronger and we are committed to you know get there. So with that, the co-chair of this committee, Council Member Richard Torres. Uh, oh, this year. Uh, th thank you, Council Member. Um, and I'm sorry, sorry the co-committee is the co-chair of this year. Uh, thank you, Council Member Rodriguez. Uh, he's thank you for your partnership, um, there's no question that the city failed uh, the driver owners. Um, but and I want to assure each and every one of you that this hearing is only the beginning, that we are committed to finding a solution because there should be no New Yorker who is stripped of their livelihood or stripped of their retirement, who's contemplating suicide. All of you did everything right. You played by the rules. You worked your heart out. You trusted the city of New York. When the city of New York tells you something, you trusted us, and we failed you. And we have to make restitution to you, and we have to do right by you. Thank so you. I want you to know that your well-being is a priority for the city council, and I'm going to work very closely with the chair of the Transportation Committee, Adonis Rodriguez, with my colleagues like Brad Lander, and work with TLC to find a solution to what is genuinely a humanitarian crisis. We can no longer afford to turn a blind eye to the suffering of you and your family, uh, because all you want is not a handout. What you want is a fighting chance at a decent life, yes, and, and that's what you deserve. So with that said, I thank you, Councilman.